Okay, welcome back everyone for day two. And today our first speaker is Steve Kilosen. Great, can, if I wander around, can you still hear me? Yes, but you too, it's not right. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, I will, I will try to remember to stay here. Uh, so, um, so I've known Bill for a long time. This is a painting that my wife, Pamela Davis, painted of him and his son, Max. I think it's in 1986. Uh, wonderful memories. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so first place, uh, uh, this talk doesn't belong in this conference, apparently. Uh, it was said at the beginning that this was a very broad conference on a range of topics dealing with the physics of living matter. Uh, I'm going to talk about the physics of dead matter, hopefully not a dead topic. Um, and uh, I asked Bill for guidance on this. And he said first he didn't want remembrances, he wanted physics. And he suggested that I discuss something involving a connection between deep theoretical ideas and quantitative experiments, even in rather complex materials. Uh, so uh, this is what I study in large measure. This is phase diagram of the cuprate high temperature superconductors uh, from a recent review article on which, well, not so recent anymore, on which I'm a um, co-author. If you're interested in knowing the state of the art in this field, I recommend this paper. It's a really crummy paper. It reads as if it was written by a committee, which it was, uh, but, it was a group of people, we all have very strong, largely disagreeing perspectives on the problem. And this paper encodes what I think are really established known facts and theoretical progress that are here to stay. So that's what this paper has to recommend it. Uh, but at any rate, this is the sort of phase diagram for these materials. The x-axis here is something to do with chemistry. It's how you change the alloying of a particular material. The y-axis is the temperature. And all these different regions are different phases and different regimes of behavior. And it's all rather complicated. Um, actually, you know, I had intended to become a biophysicist. The context of Bill's visit to me was I was gearing up to become a biophysicist. Uh, Bill and I even wrote a paper together. Uh, and then HITC came along and destroyed my plans. And I've been obsessed with this problem uh, to a level that I can't rationally explain ever since. Um, so, um, so uh, the problem of high TC has in some ways a bad rap. Uh, if you look up on Wikipedia, you find uh, a uh, perspective that almost everybody who writes an article on this for a glossy journal includes in order to justify its being published there which is blah, 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 blah. But despite intensive research and many promising leads, we don't understand anything. Um, and that's, I think, not true uh, in the review article that I just cited. We say also blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. But a qualitative understanding of the nature of the superconducting state itself has been achieved. Um, 
but the qualitative word there is important. And Bill asked me to talk about quantitative things in complex systems. Um, I was confronted with that in a more immediate context. My daughter um, uh, had a focus on philosophy of science as an undergraduate. And she asked me to explain what it was that I was doing and recognized that it really had very little to do with what she'd been taught about the scientific method. And so we argued about this for a long time and it ended up writing a paper together, uh, which I can assure you was the most fun I've ever had writing a paper um, on what it means to have a theory of a complex system. And the, um, we, I think we're quite good at outlining what the problem was. Uh, I wish we had a very clear answer for what the solution was. Uh, we have some ideas, but the basic observation is that the traditional metrics that are available for judging the success of microscopic theories which is to say quantitative comparison with experiment, uh, simply cannot be carried over unmodified to the science of complex systems. New metrics tailored for judging the success of such studies need to be defined that are no less objective and rigorous, but that are appropriate to such studies. So anyway, I would be interested, I'm advertising this paper to you. I would be interested in hearing uh, your reactions to what we propose here. Um, but now I'm going to turn to trying to do something quantitative. And here, uh, again, the lines are similar to something that Bill has advocated for maybe all of his scientific career. From his website, he has, well, a discussion of many interesting things, but there's this, this idea that these observations of functional performance point toward a very different view of life as having selected a set of near optimal mechanisms for its crucial tasks. And underlying this perspective is to ask whether there are bounds on various things that we can understand, even if we don't ask exactly how does a particular system reach those bounds, if we can understand in some quantitative sense what bounds the performance of some system, we've understood something. So uh, that's what I'm going to focus on in the context of superconductivity. Uh, what can we uh, learn from quantitative bounds uh, and then with a parenthetical apology, even if they are only approximate bounds. Okay, so Looking at these phase diagram, this phase diagram, there are a couple of places where the notion of bounds might occur to you. Uh, one is that there is a range of zero temperature phase diagram, a range of this quantity called P, which is called whole doping, which as I said, is something to do with chemistry. And the superconducting region is bounded above and below by a critical value of the doping called P min and P max in this picture. Uh, and one might want to ask what determines the range of chemistry over which superconductivity can occur. At the lower bound, there's some sort of superconductor to insulator transition that occurs that's very interesting. At the upper bound, there's some sort of superconductor to metal transition that occurs that's also very interesting. These are probably the first things that would occur to somebody uh, to study from a statistical mechanics background. And there's been a lot of study on this, but I'm not going to address that. The most obvious to an uneducated public of what you should ask about is, well, the field is called high temperature superconductivity. So what is it that bounds the maximal TC that occurs at an optimal value of the doping? So, uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about is what 
uh, whether we can understand something about high temperature superconductivity by asking the question, how high could the superconductivity possibly be? Um, I, I was originally planning to talk about many different bounds on this. We've been working on this for many years. We have some interesting new results uh, in collaboration with various people, uh, but I realized that that was probably not appropriate for this audience. So I'm going to discuss one, which was mostly done in collaboration with uh, the late Vic Emery. So um, let me remind you, I hope I'm reminding you, uh, of the essential features of uh, how a uh, fluid of electrons becomes a superconductor. So the electrons are fermions. They form Cooper pairs, which in some sense are bosons. And so that's one important feature is how do the fermions become bosons? And then those bosons in some sense condense in a way that's analogous to Bose-Einstein condensation to form a quantum mechanically coherent condensate. So those are the two features of a superconducting state. The usual way people uh, address the issues of the mechanism of superconductivity is approaching the problem from above, that is to say from temperatures above Tc, and asking themselves, how does a metal turn into a superconductor? Um, but there's, uh, so, and typically the essential problem you're trying to address here is how do you convince electrons, which are after all like charged objects and so repel each other very strongly, how do you convince them that they should form pairs of any sort? And this was the brilliance of the BCS theory that they figured out a very generic collective way that this could happen. I'm going to approach the problem in a different way. I'm going to start in the superconducting ground state and ask what classes of thermal fluctuations destroy this coherent state. So, um, so if we sit at zero temperature, we can ask what are the natures of the excitations of the system about the superconducting ground state? And there are two sorts of excitations. One are quasi-particle excitations, which have some dispersion relation, which I've written here. But the main point of this dispersion relation is there's a gap. And the magnitude of that gap, which I'll call delta, is a measure of how well bound the electrons are into pairs. Uh, the pairing is collective. So you shouldn't really think of it quite as the binding energy of a boson, but it's the closest analog, analog of that. Um, then there are also collective excitations. This is a superfluid. And the collective excitations at long wavelengths are generically defined by an effective free energy that has one physical thermodynamic constant in it called the superfluid stiffness kappa sub s. And this is an important thermodynamic character characteristic of the superconducting state, which characterizes its stiffness to uh, distortions of the superconducting phase. In two dimensions, this quantity already has the units of energy or temperature. So I'll, I'll be talking about a characteristic energy scale that characterizes the fluctuations of this superconducting phase. Uh, in two dimensions, that's just determined by this stiffness. In three dimensions, it's that stiffness times some microscopic length scale, which is typically, uh, although not always, the superconducting coherence length called C naught. And so this, this temperature T theta characterizes the temperature where if you legislated that the electrons had to stay paired 
at what temperature would simply phase fluctuations of the superconducting condensate destroy superconducting coherence. Um, <clears throat> good. So, um, so then TC is going to loosely be determined by whichever one, that's supposed to be min. From now on, read min to mean, max to mean min. It's, what? <laughs> yes, um, it's whichever of these is smaller is when the thermal excitations will have destroyed the superconducting state. Uh, that, you know, I've got that up in the corner of all slides. So uh, it, it really is important to remember that max means min. <laughs> um, okay, so within usual BCS theory, the theory that applies very successfully to most uh, metallic superconductors, TC is some number of order one, which turns out to be more or less a half times the magnitude of the superconducting gap. At temperatures above this, the Cooper pairs have simply fallen apart and there are no pairs to condense. The, uh, so the intuition is that TC is where this collective pairing ceases. And implicit in this is that the temperature scale for phase coherence is much higher than this scale. So that the moment the pairs are formed, they condense. So since we're interested in quantitative things, let me first show you why this is such a good assumption. So, um, so kappa S is a thermodynamic quantity. It's the uh, superfluid stiffness, but to get an intuition of what it means, we often write it in this form as H bar squared times the superfluid density divided by twice an effective mass. This is a little bit dumb because it's only this one quantity that's actually measured, but this is notation that makes an analogy with superfluid helium-4, where rho s is simply the density of helium atoms and m star is simply the mass of a helium atom. Um, and this then determines the zero temperature superfluid density of superfluid helium. So to get a, a intuition about what the magnitudes of kappa S that we expect, I'm going to write things in this way. I'm going to take the superfluid density to be half the density of electrons since it's two electrons in each pair. I'm going to take the mass to be twice the electron mass, since there are two electrons in each pair. I'm going to take the density of electrons to be something like one per unit cell of my crystal. And since in a typical crystal, the density is something like five times 10 to the 22nd per cubic centimeter, that's a remarkably constant value across all metals. Um, superconducting coherence lengths vary somewhat, but say a typical value of 500 angstroms, this gives a value of T theta of two times 10 to the fifth Kelvin. And given that transition temperatures are like 10 Kelvin, we're clearly very safely in the regime where phase fluctuations have no relevance to the physics whatsoever. Uh, we can do better by going working in with dirty metals. In dirty metals, this quantity is reduced by a ratio of the electron mean free path to the coherence length, which is maybe as much as a factor of 100. So we're at two times 10 to the third Kelvin, still in the regime where T theta is much bigger than Tc. Uh, we can go to thin films. In this case, the thickness of the film replaces C naught. It may be the film is 20 angstroms thick or something. We're still at above 10 to the third Kelvin. So we simply can't violate this in conventional metals. 
Okay, that's not quite true. It's possible to have granular materials where you can get into the regime even with conventional superconductors where Tc is of order T theta. But for homogeneous conventional metals, there's simply no way that this physics of phase fluctuations can be important. Now, there are several features in the coup rates that change this balance. The first and most obvious one is that Tc is bigger by an order of magnitude. The second is that the coup rates are layered. And so although this is really bulk materials, the length scale that comes in to determining T theta becomes the distance between copper oxide planes, which is like six angstroms as opposed to 500 angstroms. And the density of itinerant electrons in the coup rates is relatively low. Um, it's the uh, two-dimensional density, the density per plane, so AC is the spacing between planes, is something like P, the density of doped holes, times one over the lattice constant, which is relatively big. Um, I'm hiding something here, which is that band theory, the conventional theory of metals, would say that the density was proportional to one plus P. And there is some rather deep physics that we sort of understand why the relevant density is P and not one plus P. That makes roughly an order of magnitude difference in the estimates I'm going to include. From there on, I'll, I'll take the mass, of the, elect, the mass to be twice the mass of the electron, why not? I'll take the dense superfluid density to be half the electron density. And that gives a estimate of T theta, which is 800 times P. Uh, if instead of making these estimates, you just measure kappa at zero temperature, you get numbers that are not very different from what this estimate gives. So this is, I think you can view as an a priori quantitative estimate of the superfluid density. But then since for optimal doping, P is like 0.15, this gives a T theta of 120 Kelvin, which is right in the ballpark of the actual optimal TCs, better than this level of crude analysis uh, should warrant. Okay, so this is new physics of the coup rates that TC is determined by the phase ordering temperature rather, or at least not exclusively by the pairing scale. Um, I'm going to make one quick technical excursion. Good. Um, um, I estimated TC from the zero temperature superfluid stiffness. Uh, there was a num there's a number in the proportionality uh, I took it to be one. We can ask if we write down a model that only has phase degrees of freedom in it, how close is this number to one? We've played around with different detailed microscopic models to ask how sensitive is this number to microscopic details? And the answer is it changes by 20, 30%, conceivably by factors of two, but this proportionality, if we can ignore everything other than phase fluctuations, this piece of analysis is really relatively solid. And uh, let me skip this. Um, so there actually are some important consequences of this observation. The first is that it suggests that the pairing scale should be bigger than TC. Um, Measuring the pairing scale in the coup rates has turned out to be a little bit complicated. You measure a gap, which is certainly bigger than 2TC. Uh, the trouble is that when you measure a gap, it's a spectroscopic measure, and nobody tells you for sure that the gap you're measuring is a superconducting gap and not a something else gap. So our best estimate of the superconducting gap is that it's several times TC, not, but definitely bigger than twice TC, but I don't promise you that that's uh, true. Um, 
it has big impact for your uh, strategy for trying to get higher TC. It says the usual strategy of trying to enhance the pairing scale is a losing proposition. Since that's not what's determining TC, you want to figure out some way of stiffening the phase fluctuations. Uh, it tells you that critical fields can be big, which they are. Um, it tells you that some form of pairing persists above TC, that there are anomalously large superconducting fluctuations that survive into the superconducting state which is certainly a feature of the cuprates. Um, and in fact, all of these things are seen. So you really do learn something from this quantitative exercise. Um, so I guess I'm out of time, is that right? Okay, good. So let me then skip this. The, oh, so just very quickly, there are other bounds that become interesting. There's a suggestion that TC should be bounded above by the Fermi energy or the bandwidth. Uh, people have been studying so-called flat band superconductors of which the most prominent now is twisted bilayer graphene. That's what TBG is. Um, so here the interesting thing is that we've been able to show that you can violate this bound by an arbitrarily large amount. And good. So congratulations, Bill. Uh, this is not Max. This is Max's son, but the person holding it is still Bill. So thank you. Involved what? Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, good. So I didn't discuss, I mean, the mechanism, by mechanism in this case, you mean the mechanism by which the pairing occurs. And so um, uh, here, I think the word qualitative is important. We have very good qualitative understanding of this. So it's the proximity of antiferromagnetism. If you're close to an antiferromagnet, but not too close, you can generate effective repulsive interactions between electrons that are peaked loosely at some big wave vector. And then if you feed that into some sort of BCS mechanism, you get precisely the right D wave pairing that we have here. So at a qualitative level, we understand that. We can back that up with controlled calculations if you look at say the Hubbard model, but only if we look at small interactions where we can treat the problem perturbatively there. It's easy to show that these effects give rise to D wave superconductivity of precisely the right form. Although obviously if you're in weak coupling, TC is enormously small. So if you extrapolate that, you get this. If you study these problems numerically, you find, well, you find very complicated things. You find the things that are as complicated as the phase diagram of the cuprates when you go to intermediate coupling. But one of the things you find is an inevitable tendency to the correct sort of D-wave pairing. Let me just make a comment on the question of mechanism. The, this is sort of complicated in the need of the beam of the bit of this and a bit of that. And I think we can certainly have the question of mechanism in you know, molecular biology or some of the things that sort of disaster to the cell may have this mechanism, this and this. But some of this is a matter of sort of religion model. Right. I think that that's a big easy theory because the transition energy is so low, it won't make sort of a clear separation of scale from that specific mechanism. Just like the one thing in the problem with the separation of time scale, the one that makes this will connect directly. Whatever they sort of mix together, I'll say, I don't know. 
Yeah, so, yeah, so I, you know, generally, of course, completely agree with you. You know, there are ways you can give a definition to the problem. For instance, you can say, ask, what is the mechanism of superconductivity in the Hubbard model at intermediate coupling? Okay, that's a really hard problem, but it's a problem we can solve since we can, you know, by working hard enough, we can solve this problem. Whether that's close enough to reality to say that it has something to do with these complicated crystals, that's a, that's a question of religion, probably. <laughs> right. So, you know, if you measure the gap magnitude, so as I said, there's ambiguity about whether the gap you're measuring is really the superconducting gap. But if you measure the gap magnitude, you typically find that it's five times TC as opposed to two times TC. So, you know, this is, this is actually getting back to Daniel's point. It's actually not that you're deep in the limit where the phase fluctuations are important. What I've established beyond doubt, I believe, is that the phase fluctuations are of order one, but the gap scale is not a hundred times TC. It's you know a factor of two or three bigger than it would be in a BCS analysis, which is very notable. There's no other superconductors, no conventional superconductors that are like that. But nonetheless, it's not so far that you have this clear separation of scales that you can say that pairing fluctu de-pairing fluctuations are completely out of the picture either. Everything's of order one. Okay, is it <laughs> <laughs> I should give you this too. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Steve Block, uh, one of the generic Steves from Stanford after Steve Kilson. There's also Steve Quake, Steve Chu, Steve Shanker, um, uh, Steve Kahn, but you only get two of us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for uh, Bill Bialik Fest or, or the, the Woodstock of bio biophysics or you might call it Bialystok. Um, uh, I, I, I was promised that I should only show one slide about Bill, so um, here it is. Uh, Bill is a big guy um, with a big beard, and he likes to ask big questions. Um, here's, here are some early pictures of Bill, um, and you can see the progression from um, this rabbinical look to uh, more of a gray beard to, in fact, still more of a gray beard to here's Bill today. Um, I finally found Bill in a cartoon. Here he is. Um, this is Bill, uh, in, in, characteristically using his hands to teach a class. And the caption here says, along with antimatter and dark matter, we've recently discovered the existence of doesn't matter, which appears to have no effect on the universe whatsoever. So um, uh, although I had my own caption for this, which is true about Bill, it says, Actually, I'm trying to, trying to figure out what is truly important here. This is what Bill likes to do. He likes to ask the, the big questions. He um, has now become truly an eminence gris. Um, he is a truth seeker with a capital T and a real scientific connoisseur. So here's to you, Bill. Um, I was only told to use one slide about Bill, so now I have to talk about me. Um, who am I? Well, I got my start in biophysics from Max Delbruck, who's shown here. And this is to prove that we were all young once. Um, uh, it was Max, in fact, who told me to go off to grad school and work with Howard Berg, who sadly can't be with, with us here because uh, he passed away last year. And I had a wonderful time with Howard Berg uh, spending um, uh, 20, 30 years of my life. Um, it was uh, Max Delbruck, in fact, talking to Erwin Schrodinger in the early days that inspired a Schrodinger to put together some ideas in this book, uh, What is Life?, which many of you know about. And uh, between Max and, and Erwin, they asked questions like, are there actually any physical principles to be gleaned from the study of life? In fact, is there any new physics? And uh, uh, the answer today is uh, the jury is still out. Um, 
but Bill is one of these truth seekers who, who may, may in fact get us there. Um, so we, we uh, rewind now, and I want to tell you a little bit about Howard Berg since he couldn't be here. Uh, Berg, of course, is famous for showing that the bacteria like E. coli move through the uh, medium by literally rotating their flagellar filaments like the prop in a submarine. He had built a uh, a tracking microscope, which followed them in random walks as they moved around and showed that chemotaxis, the motion of bacteria towards food that they like or away from repellents they don't like, is done by modulating this random walk in purpose purposeful ways. Um, it's ironic that the uh, consummate experimentalist like Howard Berg actually only wrote one real theory, real, real, real theory paper in his life. He wrote it with Ed Purcell. Uh, it's become one of the most famous papers published in the history of the Biophysical Journal. It's the physics of chemoreception. Many of you have read it, and many of you will have read the little book that Howard wrote that came out of that uh, paper, um, pondering simple questions uh, that lead to profound answers about how bacteria are able to sense and move in their environment. Uh, now, it, it, this is a, it, another, another progression over time. This is the motor itself that drives the bacteria. It's draw, driven by a current of protons. Um, it's an electric motor in that sense. Uh, cells use metabolism, and then the proton motor force drives the motor. It used to be known at the, sort of this level of resolution, and as of last year, we now have it in full atomic resolution. Uh, every one of the proteins has been um, solved for its structure, uh, and that is what the, um, this, it's about the size of a small virus, and it lives in the base of every flagellum. You, um, Howard, Howard and colleagues back in the year that I went to graduate school um, developed what is now the mother of all single molecule assays as shown here. If you take a bacterium and you stick it down by its flagellar filament, the tail wags the dog, the body of the cell goes, goes round and round, and it'll spin both clockwise and counterclockwise because this motor has a gear shift. And this is the experiment that really got me started in biophysics. You can see a single cell here and you can monitor the output of the motor, which is very much smaller than the cell itself. Um, and you can see it go clockwise and counterclockwise. And it's the modulations of those clockwise and counterclockwise intervals that lead to this chemosensory pathway or the, the output of this chemosensory pathway, which allows them to um, move in purposeful ways of gradients. Um, so one of the things I did early on in, in which Bill had um, uh, some theoretical input and uh, which got uh, the, the ball rolling with understanding the um, the, the sensory system itself was to measure, if you will, the impulse response or the Green's function of a bacterium um, uh, in, in a simple averaging way in which you take this binary output and you ask what is the average um, uh, um, response of a cell. You can essentially pass a, by diffusion a small current through a, um, oh, sorry, pass a small current through an electrode and by diffusion the, uh, the molecules will leave and pass over the cell in a time very short compared to its response time in a fraction of a, a, a millisecond in fact. And then you can measure the response of a cell shown here to uh, essentially a direct delta function of of attractant. And you learn lots of things from this. Uh, one of the things we learned, of course, is they respond rapidly. They, cells actually have a short memory. This is a biphasic um, response whose integral is zero. And that means that they'll adapt fully over a period of time. That period of time is, is about the time of their memory, which is about four seconds long. Uh, this response system is uh, relatively linear. And one thing that came out of this work and comparing it with other work that, that I did in grad school was that you, you can sense as little as a single molecule changing in the, in, the, in the 600 or so receptors that are on the cell in the course of a single run. And it's that, that exquisite sensitivity, uh, which is the hallmark of, of many sensory systems, it turns out. Um, and so there's some commonalities here. And in fact, that paper of Berg's um, with, uh, with Ed Purcell has had import um, in fields well beyond bacterial chemotaxis. So now we fast forward another five years or so in my life, and I got involved in optical traps, which many of you know about. Art Ashkin received the Nobel Prize in 2018 for, for this. He was too ill at this point, being 94 years old. In fact, at the time, he was the oldest person in the history of Nobel Prizes to receive a Nobel Prize, because you can't get one if you're deceased. Um, uh, he was too ill to go to Stockholm, uh, so he in fact gave his um, Nobel lecture in the Wheeler Opera House in Aspen in one of our winter physics meetings. And uh, there's a hilarious uh, YouTube video, so if some of you are interested, you should go on YouTube and Google Ashkin Aspen, and you'll be treated to a wonderful lecture about the whole history of optical traps. And of course, as most of you know, these are the closest thing to a tractor beam that humans have created, and you can use them to grasp and manipulate things using the power of infrared light, things that are much smaller, um, uh, than we normally work with. Uh, these uh, bacteria is about a micron across, and you can make it do a square dance. 
and uh, it's it's been more than 20 years, 30 years, 40 years since the video was made, and I never tire of seeing it. Um, you can exert godlike control over a single bacterium, make it go up and down, uh, you make it go left and right, and we built this little optical etch a sketch uh, in Cambridge um, way back in the 1980s, and used it to measure a number of properties of, of, of the bacteria and their flagella, uh, which are still um, interesting to this day, uh, although we quickly moved on from this work to ask about things that are even smaller than the rotary motor of bacteria. In particular, we wanted to look at the protein kinesin. This is an abundant in your nerve cells. Nerves have a problem. The nerve that's in your hip has to communicate with your big toe. And there's actually a single cell whose cell body is in your, in your spine and whose axonal process goes all the way down to your big toe. So how do chemicals and proteins and other things that are produced in the paranuclear region, how do they ever get down to your big toe? Diffusion would never do it. And the answer is they're carried um, as cargo in vesicles uh, by a motor protein called kinesin. Uh, kinesin and its relatives are responsible for lots of things, uh, including the division of cells and the, the, the uh, separation of the chromosomes in mitosis and meiosis. Um, they're found in all eukaryotic cells. Uh, they're abundant in nerves. They, uh, if you have problems with them, you have a bunch of diseases. Uh, so kinesin is in fact the nature's tiniest little ATP fueled motor protein. And you can find cartoons on the web about how this protein and its two little feet um, they're called the heads of the protein, but they're called the feet here. Um, there's some confusion in the nomenclature about which end is which, but you can see the heads of kinesin pass one past the other as it moves. Um, this owes more to a flight of fancy because of course, as many of you know, um, the cell is about 50% protein by, by weight. Uh, and so it, it isn't this vast empty space, but can nonetheless, what we know about kinesin is lar has largely been determined by experiments like this, in which you replace the cargo with a small polystyrene bead, and then you can attach as little as a single kinesin motor to it, and using some technology that I don't have time to tell you about today, uh, but basically light interferometry, you can watch the kinesin move. Here is a bead with a kinesin molecule. It's being placed on a microtubule, and as soon as it contacts the microtubule, it moves, and that's because we provide the fuel it needs, which is ATP in the buffer. Um, so kinesin, it turns out, moves in discrete steps. Um, the steps are too small to be seen in light microscope, and in this kind of an open loop experiment, you can barely see them. Only when this, the trap gets stiff out towards the end can some, you sometimes make out little, little um, discrete jumps. Uh, but if you do the experiment right with using a force clamp, you can see gorgeous individual steps that the kinesin molecule makes. Those steps are eight nanometers, 8.2 nanometers, which is precisely the spacing of the tubulin dimers in the microtubule that it's walking along. So we know that it steps hand over hand, uh, the heads strictly alternate. We know that the, we know its stall force. We know how far it goes before it lets go. We know that it tracks what's called a single protofilament. That's the, like the barrel staves, if you will, of the, of the microtubule. And we've learned a great deal, which I again, don't have time to tell you about, about the coupling between the hydrolysis of ATP, which is a chemical cycle and the mechanical cycle by which the heads move and translocate the molecule. So, Armed with that, we then turned our view to, uh, to deeper questions in, uh, in biology. Uh, many of you know the so-called central dogma of molecular biology, first enunciated by Francis Crick, uh, whereby DNA makes RNA makes protein. And the, 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 uh, the enzymes that carry out this steps, DNA polymerase to make more DNA, RNA polymerase to make the RNA, and the ribosome, which makes the protein from the messenger RNA. Those proteins are the most fundamental, if you will, in all of biology. Without these three things, we wouldn't have any life. Uh, viruses carry often these proteins with them, uh, their own versions of them to subvert the cell they're working in, either that or they commandeer the ones that are in the cell. So all, all living forms and even parasitic forms that rely upon life work with these molecules. And the enzyme that we chose to work with was RNA polymerase. This is the enzyme that reads the genetic code. This is the enzyme that gloms onto DNA, reads off the instructions, and then makes an appropriate RNA. And there are different kinds of RNAs. Those of you who've had biology know that there are messenger RNAs, but they're also ribosomal RNAs, and they're also tra transfer RNAs, and they're uh, short interfering RNAs. They're a host of RNAs uh, that modulate the uh, metabolism and direction uh, and genetics of a cell. So it took us 20 years to do it, but we eventually achieved angstrom level resolution with um, an optical microscope. 
Uh, to do that, we had to be in a clean room uh, with acoustic isolation because if you talk, your voice shakes the microscope and you get a microphonic. It has to be temperature controlled because if there's a degree Celsius across the room differential, metals of which your apparatus is made will expand and contract and move at angstroms a second. Uh, you have to be stabilized against vibration, electrical isolation. And when you're all done, um, we finally achieved the last order of magnitude improvement by replacing the air in the volume outside the microscope with helium because helium has a refractive index which is 10 times closer to unity uh, than air itself and therefore small density fluctuations that happen when you shine a laser through the air um, are, are damped down. We could have also built in a vacuum for those of you who are physicists but that's a lot harder to do. <laughs> okay so with this, we developed a single molecule dumbbell assay. We call it a dumbbell because there are actually two optical traps and two beads held taut uh, with a molecule of DNA between them. And on the surface of one of these beads, not shown to scale, uh, is a single molecule of RNA polymerase. If RNA polymerase were the size of my fist, the bead would be the size of this auditorium. Uh, so here is a little video of that, optical trapping for dumbbells. Uh, we're, we're going to set up the apparatus. What you'll see in, in the moment when we start the video is an optically trapped bead. Uh, and then this is one of these dumbbells that's sitting on the surface. One of the beads is stuck to the surface and the other is running around like a mad dog on a leash uh, because it's doing Brownian motion on the end of the DNA. Well, in, uh, but for now, concentrate on this bead. We're moving it back and forth with an acousto-optic deflector. And we're doing that so we can calibrate our trap in both the X and Y dimensions and, uh, and achieve uh, better than uh, nanometer resolution over the course of the uh, entire experimental volume. Uh, here's how we build up the information um, and then we subtract out any anomalies. Uh, so this is thoroughly linearized across the field of view. And once we're armed with that information, uh, we can now go track this thing at one part in 10,000 of the wavelength of the light that we're using. So we're gonna capture one of these dumbbells and now we're gonna stretch it out we levitate it over the surface. These go out of focus and now we stretch it. And as we stretch it, eventually the bead on the right will move and that will tell us that we have it linked with a single dumbbell. We can actually measure the persistence length of that uh, interaction and that will tell us that we have a single DNA molecule, not two or three stretched between them. Then we're ready to run the experiment. We'll add fuel to the RNA polymerase, which are the four nucleotides, A, C, G, and U, and watch it move. And here in video, you'll see the bead moving this has been sped up uh, 30 fold and this beads in a stiff trap, this beads in a weak trap. And so this one moves and you can follow it and you can see um, that the polymerase in fact will pause at various different times. And those pauses are meaningful. They occur at the same sequences every time and they help regulate the speed of RNA polymerase. Again, more, more time is not allowed for me to go into that in detail, but let me just show you what we eventually achieved uh, these are those pauses now seen at super high resolution with the uh, latest techniques. Uh, we can blow it up by an order of magnitude. And now you're still seeing these pauses. And we're not interested in the stops. We're interested in the steps. So we're going to blow it up by another order of magnitude. And now finally, although it's moving too fast to be seen at all of these, you'll see that it stops at particular intervals. And those intervals are all integral multiples of 3.4 angstroms, which is the distance between any two adjacent base pairs in the DNA helix. So we've achieved the resolution of single base pair steps. Here you see a number of these in the various records um, as it passes. This is three and, a, three and a quarter times the diameter of a hydrogen atom. And we're watching this thing move in real time as it goes stepity stepity along uh, DNA. So if you can do that, there's a lot of things you can do. And one of the things we got into were with these ultra high stability measurements was the measuring of folding of nucleic acids because they fold in purposeful ways to do interesting things. Uh, you can do what's called the simplest one of these, the, the Bohr atom of folding, if you will, is, uh, the, is a simple hairpin. So here is a DNA hairpin or an RNA hairpin being unfolded in real time. That's the cartoon. And the beauty of this is that the extension between these two supplies a natural reaction coordinate for this unfolding reaction. Um, in fact, uh, it, it obeys some very simple physics. At, at high force, of course, it's open all the time. At low force, it's closed all the time. There'll be an intermediate force in which it flickers open and closed in a discontinuous way because the zippering of this thing, zippering it up is a highly cooperative uh, interaction. And of course, the unfolded probability beautifully obeys Boltzmann statistics. And uh, from graphs like this, you can, you can glean the opening distance of the hairpin and you can uh, glean the uh, unfolding force. 
And the beauty of this is that if you take the unfolding force and you multiply it by that distance, you get an energy. And that is exactly the free energy of opening of this, which you can determine calorimetrically. And so those numbers agree beautifully. Um, we went and did an entire zoo of hairpins. Again, this would be a, an hour long lecture. I won't take you through it, but we, could, um, we, can, we can have a predictive theory about depending on what GC and AT pairs are found in this sequence, we can actually build a model for how that should open. Um, this one has a split in it. And so you actually get two minima um, because it unzips to there and then unzips the rest of the way. And uh, we have predictive theory, which is actually quite good. Uh, an iterative um, uh, model can be developed from these, which allow us to predict the unfolding of these kinds of sequences. But we wanted to go up from there and get a little more sophisticated. Uh, so I would have to tell you a little bit about riboswitches. I don't know how many of you know about riboswitches. These are find, found in the five prime untranslated region of a lot of RNAs, particularly in bacteria. And as uh, the, the um, polymerase is going downstream to try to get to the gene, it has to first get through this five prime region. That five prime region forms an RNA, which then fold up. So here's our central dogma again. We're gonna have DNA being transcribed into something uh, and if that something codes for peptides, it gets translated. But the, the something in a riboswitch doesn't get translated, uh, but in fact exerts a form of transcriptional control in the polymerase. And here's how it does it. It's a little sequence of about 100 uh, nucleic, uh, sorry, yeah, 100 nucleic acids or bases. Um, and it folds up into something. And if adenine, this is an adenine riboswitch, if adenine is present, it binds to this thing and stabilizes this form. If adenine is not present, this would rather refold and form a loop like this. And that loop is called a terminator. It provides a signal to RNA polymerase that says, stop here, fall off, don't make the downstream gene. So this is obvi obviously a mechanism for control because if adenine is present, you don't make the terminator, you make the downstream genes. If adenine is not present, you make the terminator, you never get to the downstream genes and they're not made. So there's a feedback loop that helps stabilize the amount of adenine downstream genes. These are, uh, these are genes in fact involved in the import of adenine. Um, that get made and this, this, this feedback loop then helps stabilize and control adenine levels in a cell. So this is how a, one of some of the riboswitch works. There are other riboswitches, by the way, that interfere with the ribosome and affect translation. And there are other ones that even feed back on DNA. So riboswitches are ubiquitous, particularly in the lower level life forms, um, although they are found in some eukaryotes. And what they can do is control genes in a way separate from the kind of gene control you might've read about in high school with Jacob and Minot and repressors and activators and, and feedback control using proteins. This is control using RNA. So we developed a kind of dumbbell assay for this. We, um, we make a template free floating in solution that contains the sequence of the riboswitch and we feed it to RNA polymerase, but that polymerase is hooked to a bead and it's hooked uh, to one end of the nascent RNA by a little handle here using complementarity between the RNA and a piece of DNA that's single stranded. Uh, so then we start up transcription and this moves until it hits a roadblock that we placed at the end of the template RNA. And what it'll do is it'll make whatever kind of RNA we want. We could make a transfer RNA, we can make a ribosomal RNA. In this case, we make a riboswitch. And, but now we, we're hooked onto one end, we're hooked onto the other end so we can unfold it. And we can unfold that same molecule as many as 800 different times. And there's some beautiful theory that can be applied to this. Um, first off, there's, um, uh, you can measure uh, by, by matching this to uh, the, the uh, worm-like chain approximations, which were developed by John Marco and Eric Sidja. Uh, you can measure the, the distance between the folded and unfolded states. You can also pick out many of you an intermediate state there as well. Um, and then using a beautiful formalism developed by Chris Charzynski, uh, this is arguably the most important result of the 20th century in non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, you can actually get from this, from the work involved in opening this up in mechanical work, you can get the equilibrium free energy of the folding. And that's done by this fit here um, and other fits. And then there's a formalism due to Olga Dudko and colleagues, uh, which also tells us other information the, from the Jarzinski, uh, uh, equality, we get the free energy. And from uh, the Dudko relations, we can learn about the unfolding rates and the height of the potential energy barrier that prevents the unfolding of this and the location of that barrier. So armed with this information, we can go to town on the structure formation, both in 2D and 3D of the riboswitch. 
and I haven't got a lot of time to go into this, so I'm just going to go quickly through it. We can take it when it's mostly unfolded and allow it to fold a little bit by holding it under some tension. And the first thing that folds is this P2 part, because that's the part that has the most number of, of complementary bases in it. You'll see that these others are shorter. So this folds first, and then we can start reducing the force in steps. And as we do that, oops, this should have moved on to, oh, never mind. We've reduced the force in steps. And uh, as we do that, at each iteration, we can learn about the, the energy barriers and we can learn about what folds and unfolds. So here is the um, unfolded state, then P2 forms, then P3 forms. Then we form an adenine competent ribose switch, which hasn't bound adenine yet. And then in the absence of adenine, this will happen, but in the presence of adenine, it's stabilized. And we go to the lowest energy form here, which is the adenine bound state. And the beauty of this is that this is the kind of reaction diagram that your free energy diagram you find in all your StatMec textbooks, where they show your free energy on the vertical coordinate and they show you some reaction coordinate, whatever that is, on the horizontal axis. Um, this is one of the few times in which you actually have real data for those diagrams. You're, you'd be very hard pressed to open your textbooks and find real data on these, but we can actually find where those barriers are and where those free energies of, of, of metastability are throughout the entire diagram and put real units on it. Um, so armed with that, we decided that we try the next level of difficulty up, which is can we if actually watch this fold as it comes off the polymerase? So um, things in real life don't fold from an unfolded state to a folded state as we did in the last experiment. What they actually do is they fold bits, bit by bit as they come off the, uh, the, the, um, the polymerase or in the case of proteins as they come off the ribosome. And, and so they may get, get into states of metastability. They may even be locked into states of metastability because those are the things that form first. And in fact, the riboswitch works by that metastability. It forms something that's, that's relatively stable but not totally stable. And if adenine is lost, it forms the most stable state, which is that terminator you saw. All right, so we can actually do this, or I wouldn't be talking about it. Um, uh, but first, let's talk about what you expect. Um, here's a simple hairpin, and we're watching it fold as it comes off the polymerase. Uh, at first, we started off in this gray region. We, tr we transcribed that, and um, we did that because we had a, a blockage there, and so it stopped. It's not going anywhere. And then we start transcription, and it makes the blue part, and then makes the rising part of the stem. And of course it moves along as you might expect. But then something funny happens as it gets up to where the loop is, it tries to loop around, loop around, loop around and tries to be complementary to itself. And so you see it attempting here to pair up on the way down. Then as we make a longer piece, um, uh, it starts looping together to form the stem. And now you get something very interesting, which is that instead of elongating, the thing's actually getting shorter because for every base you make, two bases are taken up in the hairpin stem and the thing actually shortens in real time, even though the polymerase continues to elongate. And then eventually you get down to the base and then it starts elongating again, and then it runs into our roadblock and it stops. So the hallmark of this is that you actually see shortening rather than lengthening of the transcript as it's coming off and that's the folding. So here it is, you can actually watch a riboswitch switch switch in the absence of, um, of, uh, of, of adenine or in high adenine, you can actually see the difference. So here is uh, without, the adenine pr present, but with adenine present, um, the aptamer is actually able to fold and you can see it getting shorter here. And then it goes up until it reaches our little roadblock. And now interestingly enough, at that point, after a moment or two, it, it shortens. And why does it shorten permanently? That's because it reached our roadblock and now it goes to the thermodynamically most stable configuration because it has time to do this. And that's the one where the terminator is formed. And that's a little bit shorter. So you can see the difference between um, the presence of adenine and the absence of adenine. And there's a kinetic race that happens between the formation of the optimer, which would cause it to drop off and not transcribe the gene, or the presence of the roadblock, which would cause, cause it to, oh, sorry, not, I said that backwards, the optimer, which would cause it to go downstream and make the gene, or, the, or, the, or reaching a roadblock or the time it takes to make the terminator and then it falls off. So um, there's a difference of about two seconds uh, in the life of a polymerase between a minute when it makes that decision to either respect what the optimer is doing and make the gene or respect what the terminator is doing and fall off. So there's this kinetic race. 
Um, we can actually make on the basis of these experiments a nucleotide accurate um, map of what polymerase is doing, transcription begins. And just as soon as the second part of that P2 stem is made, as soon as the RNA polymerase rear end clears that, you get the exact position where the P2 folds. You can keep going. Uh, these are the positions around which the optimer folded. And if the optimer folds sufficiently um, uh, by this point, you will get transcription. Otherwise, the terminator hairpin will begin folding at exactly that position. And you'll either get termination or you'll get run through. And this is, this is the difference between termination and run through. It's just the ability to clear those few bases there. If you get run through, it runs to our roadblock and stops at exactly this position. And all of these are nucleotide accurate and they're made by, by actually measuring these, um, these, these um, different um, energy barriers and gaps in our experiments. So in summary, uh, for single molecules, we're actually able to uh, visualize both mechanically induced and co-transcriptional folding of RNAs. We can literally watch a riboswitch switch in real time uh, with functional consequences. Uh, we can map folding energy landscapes, as you saw, of nucleic acids. And these days we can combine force spectroscopy, as this is being called now, with near equilibrium folding. Uh, we can assign features of these force extension curves to folding, unfolding, binding. And I didn't have time to talk to you about it today, but there are some riboswitches which are actually ribozymes. They're actually able to do catalysis, and we can actually see those catalytic events and we can um, fold and unfold them in such a way that become competent or incompetent to carry out these enzymatic reactions, which we can then study at the single molecule level. And so I didn't get to talk about it also, but we can now combine FRET, which many of you know about first to resonance energy transfer. We can combine, put FRET pairs on our RNA and then watch folding and unfolding in the FRET domain at the same time we will look at it in the force domain. And this gives us additional information. And the, the bottom line is we can now study structure and function simultaneously at the level of single molecules. So this wouldn't be done without a beehive of activity. There are all kinds of people here. I especially wanted to show, there's Josh uh, Shavitz, who used to work in the lab. Uh, and these are the people over a 20, 30 year time span who've helped make this work possible. And uh, I thank them. And I wanna thank Bill for inspiring a lot of these ideas. Questions? Great question. So in case for those of you who didn't hear, um, there's some, some folded RNAs that form what are called pseudonauts, um, and the pseudonauts are believed to be stabilized by magnesium. Uh, can you, in fact, look at the folding and unfolding of pseudonauts, and in particular, can you look at the effects of magnesium on, on or potentially not on stabilizing these structures? So I would refer you to the work of my postdoc, Michael Woodside at University of Alberta, who's actually done this and published a couple of papers on it. So yes, it's been done and uh, you might wanna check it out. Bill. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a superb question, and it gets to the heart of the matter. Um, if you're looking at a linear polymer like DNA or RNA, and it's just in one dimension, there's one coordinate. When you look at it folding in three dimensions, there are obviously many more coordinates, uh, and you're, you, we're confined only to the single coordinate of being able to fold and unfold it along that one, one dimension. Um, the the co-transcriptional experiments that I also showed don't confine it to that dimension because it can fold up in three different dimensions. And then we, we get a readout by pulling on it, but we don't, uh, we don't see those dimensions until we pull on it. Um, so yes, we're aware of those other dimensions. And uh, one of the things that you might wanna do, and this is what we, the, the reason why we did this is put fret pairs 
on the molecule and their proximity can report on dimensions other than the one that you're pulling on. So you, do don't, you don't get total access to the other dimensions for obvious reasons, but you can ask questions like, are there metastable or pseudostructures that form um, while, the, while this main thing's coming together and can you gain access to that? That's, so one way to do it is put fret pairs on it. Another way to do it is to, is to tease it out. So you let it fold a little bit and then you pull it out again. You let it fold a little bit more and you let it pull it out again. And you ask the question about whether, um, uh, you know, there, if there's something forming off axis, right? Is there any evidence for the structure of this? Again, this is a limited representation because ultimately it's, it's being uh, projected onto the axis that you're looking at, right? But that doesn't mean you don't have access to the other, other coordinates. Totally, you just have limited information about them. But um, uh, of course, another way to do this uh, would, you don't have the experimental time to do this would be obviously to put your handles on the molecule at different places and try pulling in different places. And um, that's probably worth the effort if you think there's a really important uh, intermediate structure that's forming which you don't have access to. Uh, but absent that, um, it hasn't been worth, it hasn't really been worth going after, but it, it's always important, I think, to keep your question in the back of your mind, which is, since we're necessarily projecting onto a single coordinate, uh, what else is going on? And this is, a, this is a problem also that a lot of the people who do protein folding do, because they start with their unfolded protein in their computer, uh, usually it's just stretched out and they just let it fold. Uh, but that's, that's, of course, not the way real proteins are made. Real proteins are made one amino acid at a time, and they'll fold up as they go, uh, not, they don't start as a full, fully formed polymer and then allowed to collapse. And so the same criticism in a slightly different guise can be aimed at a lot of people who do protein folding experiments. Um, uh, it's not that people are unaware of this, they're perfectly aware that um, things can get trapped into uh, metastable intermediates. And sometimes those, those intermediates are, are perfectly stable. And, and of course, there's ample evidence in, in real biology, things like prions of proteins that have alternative states that can get trapped there and do really bad things. So it's a whole field to try to, try to understand what's happening on these other projections. Uh, and we have, only, we have just a limited bit of insight into our tiny little window, uh, but it's really important to keep you know, your question in mind. Thank you, Alex. So it's really nice to be here celebrating uh, Bill and meeting uh, a lot of people after two years of uh, two years, let's say. So what I would like to do uh, today, sorry, the microphone. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, that's okay. So uh, I will remain here. So what I would like to do is uh, uh, to talk uh, about uh, um, collective behavior in animal groups uh, and to focus in particular on the non-equilibrium non features uh, uh, present in these, uh, uh, in these uh, systems. So um, uh, biological groups like uh, uh, flocks and uh, swarms um, are ubiquitous uh, in, uh, uh, in biological systems. And uh, from the perspective of statistical physics, they are considered as archetypes of what is called the interacting uh, active matter. What is interacting active matter? You have to think of systems made of interacting units. In the case of a, of a flock, the unix would be the birds, of course. Uh, where each individual unit is self-propelled, namely it is endowed with a mechanism that uh, transforms energy into motion. Now, the very fact that there is this uh, self-propulsion mechanism, this in injection of energy at the individual level, intrinsically makes uh, these systems uh, out of equilibrium. Okay, so uh, when one uh, thinks uh, and talks about active matter, it talks about non-equilibrium features. Now, um, what I would like to discuss is how strongly out of equilibrium are natural groups of, uh, um, of, of animals, okay, like flocks and swarms, and what is the role of activity, namely the role of this self-propulsion mechanism in making these systems out of equilibrium. Now, we know uh, from a theoretical analysis and experimental findings in, in active matter that actually um, activity can have a crucial role. Okay, so here I 
just display the two examples of this uh, uh, of this uh, role that sorry this does not work so this is okay two example of uh, uh, of how uh, activity can change the behavior of a, of a system so this one is a, um, a picture that I took from the website of Cristina Marchetti, and uh, it displays what is called the motility-induced phase separation. So here, these are numerical simulations of a system of particles interacting only via repulsive forces. Okay, so if uh, uh, the system uh, uh, was an equilibrium system, so for example, particles were passive particles, there would be a boring behavior and nothing would be observed uh, in terms of collective patterns. On the contrary, when uh, the particles are self-propelled, there are these larger scale structures that are formed and which is what is called the motility induced to phase separation. So this is one example where having activity in the system really changes qualitatively the behavior that you observe. Another important example is the one on the right, and this is a simulation of the Vichsec model. I will introduce this model uh, later on in my slides, but basically this is a model where you have uh, um, particles that interact with alignment. They try to align their velocities, okay, uh, but these particles move because they are self-propelled. So if you think of the passive counterpart of this model, that would be a ferromagnet, namely the directional vectors that try to align with each other. And uh, in two dimensions, uh, uh, you would not observe any kind of order in transition. So the passive counterpart of this, uh, of this uh, model here does not have any order in transition. On the contrary, if you introduce self-propulsion, if you introduce activity, you can observe uh, the um, transition to um, a, a, a state where you have a, a large scale order, directional order, and this is a snapshot from the order state. So these two examples show you that actually activity can be very important. So, but now these are models. So what I would like to understand is um, how relevant is the role of activity in natural groups. So these are the groups that I will be studying and that we'll be discussing. A flock of birds that you can see here in this movie on, uh, on the left, and the swarms of insects here in this movie on the right. So we have been study, uh, investigating uh, both experimentally and theoretically these systems for many years now, so we have a lot of information on their behavior. So, for example, uh, even from the movie that I've shown you and from your everyday experience, uh, uh, you, you see that flocks are ordered system. So in this case, all the individuals move and follow the same direction. So if uh, uh, one wants to quantify this, one can compute the global degree of, um, uh, of alignment of uh, directional motion in the system. And one finds that this global degree of alignment, the mean group direction, which is called the polarization is very large. Is a, this is a quantity that is defined between zero and one, like the magnetization in ferromagnetic system. And in flux, it is of the order of zero nine, which means everybody flies in the same direction, okay? On the contrary, when one uh, looks at uh, swarms, uh, swarms are disordered, so there is no directional order. If one computes uh, the polarization, it is very close to zero. So these two groups uh, are different in terms uh, of the global order parameter. In one case, uh, the system is ordered, in the other case, it is disordered. The next thing that we can measure from the data on this system here are correlation functions. So what one can do is can take one individual in the group in a certain position in, in, in the group, in the flock or in the swarm, another one at a given distance, and one can compute how the, the flight directions of these individuals are correlated with each other. So this is a space correlation function directional correlation function. And what one finds is that these correlation functions are large scale in both these systems. So the, the basic experimental findings for flocks as worms are that in one case, one has a, an ordered system. In the other case, one has a disordered system, but um, correlation functions are large scale in both cases, okay? So what about uh, theoretical modeling of this kind of, of systems here? So now the, 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 the way people uh, tries to model collective motion is uh, using these very minimal models, okay, which are called the models of self-propelled particles. And uh, probably the most renowned is uh, the Vichsec model. And the idea of the Vichsec model is very simple. We need to write down uh, how to update uh, the main quantities that specify the, uh, the dynamics of each individual, namely its position and its velocity. So we have, you have an, an equation for the velocity, 
which tells us that the velocity of an individual uh, changes uh, according to this uh, force term here, which is an alignment term. So I change my velocity in, in which direction, in the, direct, in the average direction of the, loss of the velocities of neighbors, okay? I try to align with neighbors. So this Nij is, was, it was it called the interaction matrix or an adjacency matrix, and it tells me who interacts with whom, okay? And then the positions are updated following the new velocities. So this, it's a very simple uh, mechanism. So there is alignment, okay? And uh, if uh, this uh, matrix here uh, was fixed, okay, that would be like the dynamics of a ferromagnet, the dissipative dynamics of, uh, of a system with alignment interactions, with fixed mutual positions. But in these systems here, when, when, where you have self-propulsion, since the particles move, they exchange positions. Therefore, who is neighbor with whom changes in time. This means that this interaction matrix is a dynamical interaction matrix that changes in time. And this is what makes the system different from a ferromagnet or a passive system, okay? Then you can have variations of this model here. In particular here, I wrote down a generalization of this Vichsek model, which is relevant for the system that we study. where basically, uh, uh, it, Besides this first order derivative, you also have a second order derivative. But this is the general framework that people uh, use to, to describe this system. Okay, so how we can interpret the, the experimental findings within this framework? Okay, so here is the phase diagram of this uh, kind of which sec like uh, self-propelled particle models. And typically, if you put here on the x-axis the control parameters, which can be the strength of the noise, for example, and what happens is that as you decrease the strength of the noise, you get a phase transition from a disordered region to an ordered region, okay? So here, everybody flies, goes in the same direction. Here, everyone flies in a random direction, okay? So there is this transition. So where can we place flocks and swarms in this qualitative framework? So flocks are very ordered. So the polarization is very close to one. Uh, so they are in this ordered region, okay? So then uh, since this is a model with alignment, therefore with a rotational symmetry in the phase where the symmetry is spontaneously broken, there are soft modes that makes the correlation functions scale free. And this is why flocks have long range correlations in space, as I told you in, uh, in the previous slide. So flocks are here and the, the, the predictions of the model are consistent with the experimental findings that I've been telling you about. Large order, large scale correlation function. And swarms, where, where are they? Swarms are disordered, so they should belong to the disordered regions, but they have a very large directional correlations. So they cannot be here because at high noise, the correlation function decay very, very quick as in all models of this kind. So they must be in the critical region. So the bottom line of this uh, uh, summary slide is that flocks are ordered and in the deeply ordered phase, swarms are in the critical region, okay? So now, uh, what about the role of activity? So let me tell you uh, a, a little story about flocks. Uh, and the, the bottom line of this story will be that in flocks, actually, activity has not a prominent role, okay? So we can describe them with the quasi-equilibrium approaches. So this, uh, the, the, the things that I'm showing you here um, are experiments that we did on uh, flocks that perform collective turns. So here you, you can see the uh, reconstructed three-dimensional trajectories of the, of, the, of the flock performing a turn, okay? And with this data, we can, uh, we can compute uh, actually the <coughs> dispersion relation of the, of the turn. So the turn is, uh, looks uh, synchronous, but actually there is a first guy who turns and then a second guy and then a third. So we can plot the position of the guy who turns as a function of the time at which it turns, and we get these dispersion curves. So these dispersion curves, each color is a different flock. You can see that they, they have a linear behavior. So the, 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 the dispersion law, the propagation law is a linear propagation law, okay? So with a certain uh, propagation speed, which is given by the slope of this, uh, of this uh, um, line here. 
So, okay, uh, we would like to give a prediction, a theoretical prediction for this, uh, for this behavior here. And if we use uh, uh, one of the equations that I've been showing you in my previous slide, uh, what I called uh, uh, this, uh, this second model here, okay? If we use this second model here, we can uh, predict very nicely the, the linear behavior and we can give also an explicit prediction for the propagation speed. But doing what? Assuming that the network of individual is fixed. So if we assume that the network of individuals is fixed, we get a prediction, which is this one, which gives us a relation between the speed and the polarization of the system. And this prediction is very well obeyed by the data. So just assuming that the network is fixed, we get a very nice prediction of, uh, of the real behavior. So this suggests that activity is not really very important to explain this kind of phenomenon. And actually, if you look at the trajectories during the turn, you see that the birds actually turn in a way that they keep their neighbors during the whole turn, okay? So really, it's true that the network remains the same. Another indication that here activity is not so much relevant is given by inference. So we tried uh, together with um, Abil, Alessandra, Thierry to apply uh, maximum entry models to this system to get information about the uh, intrinsic parameters regulating their collective motion. And what you find is that if you use inference techniques that are basically static equilibrium techniques, or if you use infinite techniques which are dynamical, you get the same value for the inference parameters. And why is that? Because actually, if you look at these two time scales, this is the time scale with which directional information is propagated along the system, the time scale with which correlation decay, directional correlation decay. And this is the time scale with which the network rearranges. These two time scales are well separated. Okay, so basically directional information passes through the group on much quicker timescales than the timescale on which uh, the network arranges. So and this is an explanation why quasi equilibrium approaches work very well to explain what we see in flocks. So now in swarms, uh, things are different. Okay, and uh, why are they different? Uh, because we can see that on the contrary, in this case, uh, activity is really crucial if we want to explain what we see in the data. And uh, here is an example of one, uh, one phenomenon that we cannot explain if we don't uh, include uh, uh, the role act of activity. So these, uh, uh, what are, uh, the, the functions that are displayed here are uh, space-time correlation functions. So I take uh, two birds at a certain dense, two insects in this case, at a certain distance in the group and at different times. And, those, and I see how strongly the flight directions are correlated. So this is a space-time correlation function. And it is, uh, it is plotted uh, in k space, and this k is fixed to be one over the correlation length in, uh, in these groups, okay? So all these curves are different swarms, and they decay on different time scales. Now, what we can do is to assume as an hypothesis that the dynamic scaling holds. What does it mean? It means that we assume that larger regions decay on larger time scales, and that there is a specific relation between the, the correlation time and the, the length scale at which we are looking at, which is this relation here. So if we assume this, what we can see is that we can make all these curves collapse together. Namely, if we express a space-time correlation function in terms of, in, this, in displaying this correlation function, we express positions in units of correlation lengths and times in units of correlation times, they all collapse one on top of the other. And here you can see the collapse. So here the, the, the variable is T, here is the variable is T divided by the correlation time. You see that there is a, a very nice collapse. And uh, this collapse identifies uh, this exponent here, which is called the dynamic critical exponent, with, which classifies the dynamical universality class of this, uh, of this behavior. Okay, so what we find from the data is this value of the dynamic critical exponent. So this value, uh, we can sort of make the same exercise that we did with flux. We can say, okay, let's assume that activity has no role and let's make a theory with no activity, a theory for a passive system of the same kind. 
This has to be done using uh, field theory with the renormalization group techniques, but one can do that. And if, if you disregard the activity, what you get for Z is a, is a value that is different from the one that we found in the data. So clearly in this case, you have to take into account uh, activity. And this is also confirmed by this other, by this other plot here. Here I'm plotting uh, the correlation function <coughs> of the directional uh, degrees of freedom and the correlation function of the network. Okay, so you can see that these two correlation function decays on the same, in the same way. So here uh, we, I fix the scale. So let's say I look uh, at uh, a scale of order. In this case, it is 0, 0.5, 0, 0, 0.05 meters. In this case, it's 0. 0.15 meters, but in both cases at any scale at which I look, this correlation function of the network and of directional information are always the same, okay? So remember that in the case of flocks, they were se well separated. In this case, they are always the same. So the network moves on the same time scales as the, the, the directional information propagates. So clearly we cannot uh, uh, disregard one with respect to the other, okay? So this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, experimental findings suggest that th there is a different uh, situation for flocks and swarms, and we would like to have a sort of theoretical interpretation of what is happening. So to do that, I mean, the question that I now ask is when is activity relevant? How, we quantify, how can we quantify the degree of non-equilibrium in the system and what changes across the phase diagram, flocks versus swarms, okay? So to do that, uh, we can look at a very uh, simple model, like the which second model in two dimensions, okay? So the simplest thing that one can look at from the theoretical point of view. And uh, starting from this simple equation, these are the same equations that I've shown you before, but in 2D, which is even simpler, okay? So one can start from this equation, the update equation for the velocity that is in 2D is represented by an angle and the update equation for the position and try to compute something that quantifies the degree of non-equilibrium of the system. What is this something? So there is a quantity that people uh, have been using a lot to, to quantify the degree of non-equilibrium of a system, which is the entropy production rate. Okay, so what is the entropy production rate? It, it, the entropy production rate is, is built in the following way. You take a trajectory of your system, let's say this one here, and then you consider the time reverse the trajectory, okay? So you take the, uh, as initial position, the final position of the previous one, flip velocities and get to the backward trajectory, okay? And then you consider uh, the probability of the forward trajectory divided by the probability of the backward trajectory and you take the logarithm and uh, you define this as an entropy of this individual trajectory, okay? Then you take an average over all your dynamical trajectories, divide by the time, because this of course depends on the time, on the time length of the, of the trajectory you are considering, and take the limit of time going to infinity. And this defines the entropy production rate, what is called the entropy production rate. Why is this an interesting quantity? Because if the system is in equilibrium, it is zero. So, I mean, uh, the, the larger the entropy production rate, the larger uh, is uh, uh, your system out of equilibrium. And then the other interesting feature is that for Langevin uh, 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 dynamics as the equations that I'm considering here, it can be computed, okay? So we can compute this. And uh, what we get is an expression, uh, these two expressions are equivalent with each other uh, in the stationary state. So we can look at either at this or at this. And this equation can be easily computed in a numerical si simulation. So we can do a numerical simulation of our which sec model in 2D. We have this expression here and we can compute the entropy reduction rate, okay? And the interesting thing uh, is that I want to um, make this comment is that in this form here, uh, the entropy production rate corresponds to the work of the active forces because here you see it, it is the derivative of the um, interaction matrix. So this, this expression here is telling you that you produce more entropy um, proportionally to how the network changes in time. Okay, so this, this is also an interesting interpretation of what we are looking at. So if you compute this thing numerically, uh, we have been doing this in two different VHSEC models in which we consider different kinds of interaction between individuals. 
In this case, individual interacts with other individual within, the, within a certain given metric range, which is called big R in the following. And in the other case, uh, each individual interacts, interacts with the uh, Voronoi neighbors, okay? And why we chose to look at these two different variants, because uh, we know that swarms are of this kind and flocks are of this kind. So we wanted to look uh, uh, at all the uh, interesting scenarios for what, uh, for what concerns the systems we are interested to. Um, so, and the, the important result that I want to underline is that uh, the entropy production rate, okay, peaks at the ordering transition in both cases. So you see this, this, this result is telling us, look, uh, uh, your system is more out of equilibrium if you are in the critical region. And so this is perfectly consistent with what we saw in, 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 the, in the experimental data. We saw that flocks that are in the deeply ordered region, they are here, they belong to a part of the phase diagram where the entropy production range is small, the rate is small. While as worms, which are critical, they belong to a region of the phase diagram where the entropy production rate is large. So this, this gives an explanation of what we found in the data. The second interesting thing is that we could also verify that this region, these regions of high entropy production rate and low energy production rate corresponds to region of different diffusivity in the system. So if you look at the mutual diffusion, how uh, quickly and uh, how um, uh, frequently um, uh, particle can exchange mutual position, what you find is that this mutual diffusion is uh, larger at the transition and lower for different reasons in the deeply ordered phase and in the disordered phase. So this, this is also consistent with what we find uh, in, uh, in the data. Then another, how, how much time do I have? Okay, so I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, very quickly tell you another thing, that the, um, uh, the entropy production rate can be recasted in a way where um, some quantities appear that can be computed in the data. So I think this is also an interesting, uh, an interesting result. So in this expression here, this epsilon is a density of entropy production rate and it has an explicit form. And this Q alpha phi is uh, um, a a per correlation function that tells us how many particles we have that are at a distance with each other equal to the interaction range and mutual angles in their spatial disposition and directional disposition, which are specified by alpha and phi. So I don't, I don't have the time to explain all this, but the important point is that we have predictions on, of, on uh, how this uh, Q alpha phi should look like. And in particular, the fact that the entropy production rate is larger than zero means that this function here must be um, non-symmetric. So th there must be an asymmetry in this uh, pair correlation function that indeed we find in the data. So in the data, we find this asymmetry. And uh, uh, this, uh, this is consistent with the numerical simulation, but the important point is that uh, this is something that can be computed on the data. So the bottom line of what I've been telling you is that uh, activity, uh, it, it, it's a priori an important quantity in the behavior of this system. But I mean, how uh, important is its role models? And if we think uh, about natural groups, it is stronger in swarms that are in the critical region and uh, less important in, in flocks. And uh, uh, also, I think that another uh, consequence of what, what we found from the theoretical analysis is that there can be uh, um, uh, quantities that quantifies this entropy production rate that could be measured in the data. So the next uh, question is that whether we can really measure that in, in real data and what, that, uh, what, I mean, this entropy production rate looks like uh, when, when we really measure this. Okay, so this is uh, the end of it. And uh, so these are all my collaborators and in particular the work of entropy production rate is mainly the, the work of this PhD student. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering, so a lot of these models tend to be um, like local interactions only. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering like, at least 
like for the flocks, uh, there's at least a plausible mechanism how you could get long range interactions. So like in those- so Sorry, I couldn't hear. It seems like there's at least a plausible mechanism how you could get longer ra long range interaction in the case of the flock specifically. Like in all these movies, when they turn, yeah. you, you can tell that they're turning. So if I'm a bird and everybody in front of me already turned, seem like I can start reacting to that sooner than like neighbor to neighbor to neighbor interaction. So I was wondering if, just because it kind of gets dark in front of me, um, I was wondering, does that leave any signatures in your analysis that you can tell that this is occurring, not occurring? Um, Cause if there is a mechanism for information to propagate faster, it seems like evolution would make use of it. So should I be surprised that the local model is such a good model? So, um... Uh, the fact that interaction is local, we, we have, I mean, we have several indications of that. Uh, we apply the inference techniques uh, to retrieve the interaction range. We apply the, uh, some other techniques on the data, which are not inference that indicates exactly the same thing. So we are pretty sure that interaction is local, even though not metric in the case of flocks. Uh, what we understood is that they coordinate with a given number of individuals around them. But nevertheless, it is local. And but I, I also wanted to comment on on something that you said. Actually, the in, information propagation is is pretty quick and efficient in this way. It depends on the propagation speed, of course. But the propagation speed is very very large. If you compute it in flocks, it's really in the in the reference frame uh, of, in which the flock is still. I mean, it's forty times the speed of the individuals. So it's really very very quick. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Can you speak to the microphone? Yeah. Have you seen movies? It seems like a lot of I feel like the question has to be really interesting now. Um, <laughs> um, at least in the movies for flocks, it seems that so much um, there's so much coordination on the boundary. The boundaries are so interesting. Yeah. So I wonder what inside this theory, especially given that birds are keeping their neighbors, offers as to what's going on in the boundaries. So this is uh, uh, for sure a very interesting question. How does the boundary affect uh, the behavior of the, of the whole group? Um, of course, uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, ex experimentally to investigate this issue, um, but uh, this is something that one has to, has to look for. So for example, what I can tell you is that when you look at these collective terms, uh, they, they start at the boundary, okay? So uh, it, it could be because uh, the boundary is more susceptible to perturbation. So individuals on the boundary see something and then uh, they start to doing something and the other follow. It can, could also be also due to, to the topology of the network, the precise topology of the network, so that individuals on the boundary have a sp special topology. They interact with less uh, individuals than the others. And for the same reason, they are more susceptible even to, to noise. So for sure, the boundary is uh, something that has to be dealt with uh, with more care. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Very happy to be here. And uh, for the occasion, I decided to talk about a topic which I think is very uh, dear to uh, Bill, which is the fundamental limits. He started with this uh, thesis and then he's been working on this several uh, occasions. Um, I'll take, a, of course, a slightly different point of view. So we might along the way disagree on a few things, but I've known Bill for uh, we met first at NEC, I think, thanks to Adrienne. So by now, I think I, I, I know he's going to appreciate. And uh, happy birthday. So let me get started with uh, uh, the, what I mean by uh, decision making in biology. Just give you a few examples of what uh, I have in mind. Um, the first example is the classical one, which is also in the 
majestic paper that I'm going to mention uh, shortly of Bergen Purcell is the example of bacterial navigation is run and tumble of bacteria. They want to estimate the concentration or even better the gradients of uh, concentration and then decide whether they're going the right way or the wrong way and they're going to go or they're going to tumble. Uh, other examples, uh, to grow or not to grow uh, for, a, for a cell, should, should, should the cell divide uh, if the conditions are proper, and that's a decision which needs to be made, there's some sensors and, and the, the decision to grow. Um, another example that we, we've considered is the example of the immune uh, uh, T cells. And the decision which has to be faced by, uh, by the receptors and the T cells is whether the ligands that are going to get bound are, are getting bound, uh, they are self or not self. And depending on whether it's self or not self, which essentially means about the binding time of these ligands, the system has to trigger uh, at least the first step of an immune response or has to stay silent because otherwise there's going to be an autoimmune disease which might get triggered. So it's an important decision to be made. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth example here is morphogenesis, which is the example that uh, uh, Thomas yesterday was, uh, was uh, discussing, which is the cell position in an embryo. Of course, the uh, cell doesn't know exactly where it is, head or tail. What it can do is that it can measure uh, concentration of different morphogens and uh, uh, proteins and uh, has to figure out out of all this where it's placed in the cell and this is going to trigger downstream pathways that are going to uh, to give the, uh, the, the the cell fate to determine the cell fate. So all, all these are all examples where uh, there's some sensing uh, typically of some uh, uh, concentration and then there must be a decision which is, uh, which, is, which is triggered, which could take all these different uh, forms. And um, the, the seminal contribution in all this was the paper by uh, 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 Bergen Purcell um, that considered at, at the time the examples that they were considering were the examples of uh, bacterial chemotaxis and, bacteri uh, and bacteriophages, as you will see momentarily. The, uh, the idea is that you have uh, a receptor, there's a ligand, and you would like to know how much you can determine of, the, uh, uh, of this concentration, what kind of bounds and what kind of limits you are going to have. Um, the setup is that you have a, 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 the receptor has a size S, the radius of, this, of the cell is uh, A, and the estimate that they make is that the number for a perfect absorber, uh, absorbing sphere, the number of molecules that are, uh, the rate is uh, C, the concentration times A times the diffusivity times capital T, and uh, the square root of this is going to give you the, uh, the error rate. Now, there's, um, all this is relatively well known, it's taught. Uh, there's one point which I would like to stress in all this, which is the main point that I will get to, is the fact that the, uh, the setup takes a fixed time, capital T. So, in the, it, which is apparently an innocent thing to do, but in fact, it's, it's quite important. So what is being assumed here is that the cell is going to measure for a fixed amount of time, capital T. Um, out of this, then you can you can estimate the uh, 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 via the, the standard stuff. You can estimate the time t, which is going to be required. You inverse the relation, and you 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 say what is the time which is required to achieve a certain precision, and this is going to be the expression that you have that you have on the board. But this time, remember, it, it, it's fixed. And it's been used to estimate time scales, gradients, uh, 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 role of the cell size, and so on. Now, um, this is a general problem. In fact, it's been, uh, it's been encountered in olfaction as well. It's an example that I've not mentioned among the four, but there's, uh, there's application in olfaction as well. Now, uh, the, 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 the funny thing mentioned in the paper is, uh, uh, which, which sometimes is not, is not taught, but it's fun to see how much this uh, paper, this simple physical argument solved a big biological problem, because at, at the time there were data about uh, phage, uh, bacteriophages absorption rates. And in this paper here of 76, just prior to the, to, to, to the Bergen Purcell paper, they were very troubled. They, they mentioned this as a paradox, is the fact that the 
um, the, the absorption rate of bacteriophages was saturating for a minute uh, fraction of the receptors covering the cell. It was less than 0.1%. And therefore for them, it was kind of very shocking because how could it be that with 0.1% of coverage of the cell, you essentially already reach saturation. And of course, the solution of this is uh, they were looking for hunches, they were looking for very complicated uh, structures of the receptors. And the solution that came with the paper of Bergen Purcell is just that this is the physics of diffusion. The, the, the molecules are going to bump several times on the, on the surface of the cell. And therefore, these multiple encounters are just due to the, to the, physics, to the physics of diffusion. And you can have uh, 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 expressions that, that give you the flux as a function of the fra fraction of the maximal uh, uh, flux, which is, which is given by a perfect absorber. And uh, an expression which works very well is this paper by Swansik, uh, the guy of statistical physics, who did a, a beautiful mean field. And typically when I teach this, uh, this subject, uh, I give these two papers to read. One is the Swansic paper, which takes a very high profile mean field uh, approach to this kind of problem. And the other one is the contribution by Bill, who went into the, to the understanding really how this unbinding and rebinding of the different molecules goes. And it's, it's actually far from being trivial if you really wanna understand this, this rebinding process in all the details to get back to it. So these are two papers that, uh, that, that um, I give to read, but there's many more, of course. There's the paper by Ned and Thierry. There's the paper by Andrew Magler. This, this kind of approaches has been, has been applied to a number of different situations to, to estimate uh, gradients, to estimate different things. So let me tell you, though, why this, is, this can be uh, uh, a little bit dangerous to take this as a, as a limit. And the reason is that this kind of arguments at the Alaberg and Purcell, they capture the scaling, but in fact, they're not the bound. And the reason why they're not the bound is exactly this uh, assumption of having a fixed time capital, capital T. Why this is not a good, a good thing to do? Just imagine for a second that you accumulate along the way, you're accumulating some signal, you're accumulating some, some realization of a stochastic process, and you want to tell, for example, what's the concentration. Now, in some realizations of this process, the concentration is going to be estimated very well just because of the fluctuations and the realization of the process. You're going to have a very good estimation with a very tight uh, error on this. Some other realizations, so you can stop Accumulating, uh, accumulating evidence because on that realization, it's actually, it's actually uh, a good one and you can stop, you can cut it short. Some other realizations are going to be unlucky. Therefore, what is going to happen is that you have to extend because in order to get to a good estimate, you have to accumulate more evidence. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the fact of limiting to a single uh, uh, time is something which is, uh, first of all, is not realistic because the cell is certainly not the bacterium, for example, is not gonna wait for three seconds and then decide. It's going to tumbling, the tumbling time, it's, uh, uh, it's a random process and it's going to, 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 to be distributed. It's not gonna be a fixed time. But the second thing is that it's not effective and it's not effective, it's gonna be very, very visible. But before setting up this and telling you that it's not effective concretely and to show you why it's not effective, the other point that I would like to make is that typically the cells, at least in biology, you never measure something just for the pleasure of knowing that the concentration is something. You typically, what you do is that you measure something and then you couple the measurement with a decision, which is, for example, to tumble or not to tumble. Therefore, what you do, the simplest setup that you can have is that you measure concentration, but what you would like to know, for example, is whether the concentration is above or below a certain threshold. That's the easiest setup that you can, you can possibly have. Of course, you can have more complicated stuff, but let's consider this simplest setup, which is whether or not you're above or below a certain threshold of concentration with a given uh, error bar, which is going to be, uh, uh, is going to be uh, um, defined in a second. So the simplest setup is, is the following one. You have a receptor, there's a ligand bound or unbound with given rates, and you want to know whether the concentration is above or below a certain threshold. And here comes the, uh, what I was telling you before, which is the fact that if you limit, if you have a fixed time, this is not a very good thing to have. Just take these two examples here. In the first case, 
it's quite clear that the concentration is very high because the, the, the receptor is bound practically all the time. Therefore, it's obvious you can cut it short very easily. In the second example, it's bound and unbound at 50%. Therefore, you have to extend before deciding because otherwise the risk of making the wrong decision is very high. So what I'm telling you here is that decisions, in order to be uh, made effectively, have to be made on the, on the fly and have to be adapted to the realization of the, of the stimulus. And, um, and of course, this means that the time of decision must be random and not just because it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's your pleasure, but because it's going to be more effective. Now, what can you do when you, the time now is random? Because now you have something to do. You have to decide when you're going to decide, when you're going to cut it short. And here comes a uh, work which was done by Abraham uh, Wald, uh, who was uh, thinking about uh, processes of applying uh, applied to medicine, decision theory to medicine, when you should stop delivering a treatment and when can you tell whether a treatment is effective or not effective? And clearly it's something important. And at the same time in the, in, uh, in the uh, Soviet Union, people were thinking along similar lines in, in order to have uh, industries, they wanted to know whether the productivity was going up and down. And therefore they wanted something to tell them when a process was changing, the statistics of a process was, was changing. So the two things uh, uh, got together. I'll tell you what uh, Wald uh, did. And in particular, what he introduced is this sequential probability ratio test, which um, is in general for binary decisions. It can take more complicated form, but in the simplest possible setting, you want to decide whether the concentration of this uh, process bind and bind to the, to the receptor is above a certain threshold L1, which is the L bar of your threshold plus a epsilon over two, where epsilon is the error rate, or it's below L, uh, below L2, which is here. And what Walt is, uh, is telling you that you should be doing uh, is that you should be calculating uh, on the fly along the process, just keep measuring and calculate the log of the ratio of the likelihoods of whether you are uh, uh, explaining the data with the likelihood of the, of the process that you're observing, given the concentration L1 over the probability, the likelihood of the ratio L2. And then what you should be doing is that you should keep measuring this and you should put a threshold at k and minus k on this log likelihood that you're measuring. And the process should be stopped whenever you reach either the threshold capital K, then you call this decision L1, or you reach the lower bound, which is minus K. And K is given by this expression here that I don't derive, but it can be derived quite, quite easily. Now, this is optimal. So if I give you the error rate, the, you're guaranteed by the, world of, uh, by the work of Wald that the mean decision time for this is going to be optimal. So you cannot beat this. Given epsilon, that's the minimal time of decision is going to be given, it's going to be given by this. And um, of course, this is a, a, a discrete process, but in the limit where decisions are, are hard, it's going to go for a long time, and therefore you can take a continuous approximation for this process, and the log of the likelihood is going to do a biased uh, random walk with the velocity V and with the diffusivity D, which can be calculated from the microscopic details of the process. And you can calculate the first passage time that you're going to hit one of the two boundaries. And in particular, this can be calculated simply from uh, solving a Fokker-Planck uh, uh, problem. And it's given by this expression here, given K, given V, and given D, you get this expression in terms of the hyperbolic uh, tangent. Now, um, the idea with uh, the work with Eric was to, uh, first of all, to remark that this was, uh, uh, this was uh, useful. Second, to apply it to the, to the immune case. Uh, previous to, the, to, to that, there were, there were applications in uh, neuroscience and in uh, social interactions. The references are there. And since then, it's been used for non-equilibrium thermodynamics by Hulicker, Frank Hulicker, and this, and this group. So it's a, general, it's a general result, which I find uh, uh, very useful and very important, because this is really a bound. This is really a limit. You cannot go below this, uh, this average time here. But you have to introduce this capital T. And in the example, 
example of the immune system that we played with with Eric, we saw that in fact, this can make a big difference. If you take a fixed time T and you compare with what the world uh, 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 SPRT can give you, the, the, the scalings are right with respect to Bergen Purcell, but the pre-factors can be very different. So you can easily gain factors that can go factors four, five, or even you can get to 10 very easily. So if you make estimates of the times, you can get this wrong by factors four, five, or 10 quite, quite easily. Then when Alexandra heard this, uh, this result, she said, well, maybe this is gonna be useful for the case of the, of the, of the fly. And, um, so we decided to embark on this and to and to look at the paper uh, to look at the work on the on the fly and the decision to be made for the uh, for the, the positional information of the fly. So you've already heard the talk by uh, by Thomas. The fact that the fly is uh, uh, 500 microns is 150 microns in the other direction. This is a picture of the embryo which is going to develop. Uh, it goes through, uh, in the first couple of hours, it goes through 13 cycles of very rapid uh, decisions. And uh, the patterns that are getting laid down, uh, Bicoid and Hunchback, uh, the action is happening around the cycle 11, 12, and 13. This is the time at which the, the profiles are getting shaped. And in particular, there's a morphogen gradient of Bicoid, which extends roughly like an exponential. It's the green cur curve that you look on the screen. And then there's the first step downstream, which is Hunchback. And Hunchback is already getting much, much steeper. And as Thomas was was uh, discussing yesterday, the profile is quite steep and goes from essentially one to zero in a, in a, on, a, on a length scale, which is of the order of 2% of the egg length, which is roughly one, uh, one nucleus. And for this to happen, it, it is required that the precision in resolving the bicoid concentration, because it's essentially all determined by bicoid, there's a few more factors, but most of it is coming from bicoid. Uh, the precision in resolving the concentration of Bicoid should be of the order of 10%. Um, now, 10% um, by itself is not, it's not a shocking number. What is shocking in the case of uh, 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 Drosophila is the fact that this 10% must be attained very rapidly. In particular, the evidence which is coming from the data on uh, MS2 uh, profiles of, uh, of uh, uh, transcription is that, as you can see in the curve uh, uh, down here, uh, the lower one that you, can, uh, uh, that you can see here. No, where is it? Uh, this one here. You can see here that the profiles of uh, hunchback are going from a very low level to the level that they attain in a roughly steady state in something of the order of three minutes. Okay? So this reading of the 10% precision of Bicoid must be made in time scales of the order of three minutes. And this is the challenging part because three minutes is something which is relatively short. Now, if you use uh, Bergen Purcell estimates, uh, this is something which uh, cannot be attained cannot be attained with the numbers that are available. Roughly, you, you don't manage to get this 10% uh, this in three minutes. It takes much longer than this. And you can think about other ways of doing this, which in particular have to do with diffusion. The group of Peter Ryan, uh, Ten Walde, for example, has introduced diffusion. Diffusion is gonna speed up, but by itself is not gonna reach three minutes. And the second thing which is gonna do for you is that the steepness of the profile that you've seen of Hunchback, which has a hill coefficient of the order of five or six, in fact, is gonna get blurred and therefore it's gonna extend and the, and the, the hill coefficient is gonna, is gonna go down. So that's when uh, we started discussing with Alexandra who said, well, maybe the, 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 it's the fact that Bergen Purcell is actually not the limit, it's not the bound. So why don't we try and see whether with decisions on the fly, we are managing to get to this, this lower bound. And the answer is uh, yes, uh, you can actually go to this lower bound. And um, the way this is done is the following. You take a uh, promoter that has a certain number of binding sites, in particular, there's six Bicoid binding sites. And you want to see whether you manage, as I told you before, to discriminate between uh, 0.95, uh, I normalized to one the, 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 the concentration, um, 0.95 and 105. So if you sum the 
2.05, you're going to get to the to the to the to the 10 percent that you want to uh, that you want to achieve. And uh, the structure of the binding of the binding sites is given by this. You can have seven possible states that go from totally unoccupied zero to totally occupied six, and you have a certain number of uh, 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 transition rates that uh, you can you can play with over this this uh, this system. We deliberately take the the promoter to be very simple because what we want to do is we want to see whether or not we can go below the three minutes. So anything like an enhancer or anything like a non equilibrium uh, uh, dynamics is just going to help us. It's, it's therefore we want to stick to the equilibrium case and we want to stick to the basic promoter with just six binding sites because what we want to see whether we want to achieve we can achieve these three minutes and this is the plot of the time that it takes for such a promoter which uh, i'm going to explain in a second how this is calculated and you can see that for k equal one two or even three you can actually go below these three minutes and it's not a problem to get uh, to get below this limit of three minutes now uh, the interesting part is not only that you can do it, it what comes out of all this is actually some, some insight that uh, uh, initially, for example, I was very uh, troubled when I started studying this, uh, this system by some results by uh, 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 Hernan Garcia and this group about the, the binding times of Bicoid on the promoter. Uh, the plots are given by the curve that you see over there, and you see that the binding time of the bicoid on the on the binding side is, ex is actually extremely short. It's of the order of a fraction of a second. And in the paper as well, it was said, well, it's it's kind of troubling. It's paradoxical that there's such a short binding time. How can you manage to regulate if you bind so shortly? And out of this, in fact, you understand that this must be done because what you want to do is exactly to bind and unbind all the time because that's the way you can make fast decision. It comes automatically out of all this. It comes out of this that you want to have weak binding site, in fact. It comes out of this that you want to be at the border of the K where you decide, because as in information theory, you want to jump over the border of, of on and off all the time in such a way as to make decision as fast as possible. So there's a number of insights that come out of this that uh, uh, are in the paper and we can discuss more, but still I would like to give a few details on how this is done because otherwise it looks like uh, uh, black magic and it's not. And there's a couple of methodological points which I think are useful because as I said, the SPRT is actually quite a general tool. So it could be useful in other contexts. Uh, so what we do, we, we uh, as I said, we have this uh, binding rates. We have the, uh, uh, the, the number of bound transcription factor over the six. And depending on the value of K that you put, the green line in this case being two, you have that the, uh, uh, the promoter is, by, is on on off. It takes just two states. And you keep doing this along the way. And you calculate the log likelihood that the uh, uh, concentration of the ligand is above the threshold or below the threshold L1 or L2 that I was mentioning before. Um, out of all this, you can calculate the distribution of the times that the, 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 the promoter is on, the time that the promoter is off. These are uh, non-exponential waiting times out of this seven state Markov chain. And, um, the, now what you do is that you calculate the first exit time to the upper boundary or the lower boundary, which is given by the expression that I was uh, mentioning before. And um, you calculate the velocity. It, the, the velocity is easy to calculate. It's given by this expression here, where the DKL is the kullback leibler uh, uh, entropy difference uh, uh, divergence between the case on and the case off. So this is going to give you the velocity. And then the other thing that you, you use is a relation that we uh, found out, which is the diffusivity is equal to V. So for those of you who immediately check dimensions, don't be shocked because the, the quantity which is, uh, uh, which is wandering around, it's a log of a likelihood. Therefore, both D and V have dimension of one over time. So this relation is not obviously wrong. And it's coming in fact from the fact that the, uh, uh, the log likelihood of a Bayesian process that you're updating with the Bayesian uh, uh, rule um, has a property which is the mean is not going to change. 
And when you work out the details, you do a little bit of algebra. The way that the reason, uh, the, 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 the consequence of having the mean that doesn't change is that diffusivity and uh, velocity in the drift of the uh, log likelihood have to be equal. That's the, con that's the condition that ensures that the likelihood, uh, log like the mean is gonna, stay, uh, is gonna stay fixed. Therefore you use this mean time and you can calculate out of this mean time, the decision, the time that is going to take and uh, this is the way we get the, uh, uh, these, these curves that you have over there. Now, of course, the obvious question is, okay, you calculated all this with this log likelihood, but how, how in the world the cell is gonna calculate the log likelihood? This is a complicated quantity. So there's no way the cell is gonna calculate the log likelihood. The answer is that this is in fact not, not quite true. You can make a plot of what the contributions to the log likelihood are as a function of the binding time or the unbinding time. And the profiles that you get are those that you see up there. In, in red, you see the contribution to the log likelihood for the binding case. And the other one is the contribution of the off time. The off time is actually a straight line by itself with an offset. The uh, red curve is not quite a straight line, but you can just make it a straight line, okay? Uh, of course, you're gonna pay a price, it's not gonna be exact, but that's what, you, that's what you do. And now having these two contributions, you can make an easy, uh, a simple model, which is simply that you have a promoter where uh, stuff is getting together. There's a, a delay time for the starting of the transcription process. And then when this is off, there's a delay time for, for, uh, uh, for the, the disassembling of the system. And then you have degradation of the mRNA. And when you put all this together, you get, uh, you get something which is not quite optimal as it would be if you were to take the exact curve, but it's still below the three minutes and you can get the sharp profile of hunchback that you have here. So what, of course, there's no uniqueness. I'm not telling you that this is what happens to the cell, but what I'm telling you is that there's absolutely no contradiction in having these three minutes and having a decision which is made at the level of the single cell without any intercellular communication, which of course can happen, but it's not needed a priori. So one should be looking for this kind of, of solutions. They don't, they are not prevented by any, by any principle. And I'm done with time. So let me skip the mitotic domains that we are doing right now and let me get to the end. Thank you. Yes. So fascinating. How do you imagine these delays are implemented at the level of motors down? Yes. Well, just the fact that it takes a little bit of time to disassemble, for example, all the complexes that have to go into transcription, or in the case, the time that it takes for the, for, you know, the, the transcript, well, you know, you know, as well as you can possibly. Uh, so it takes a little bit of time for transcription to start. It does a few trials and then it starts really after a few trials. So this can be, for example, the delay time for, for the transcription to get, to get, to, to set up. Yes. We we can look at this. We can look at this later. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the log likelihood is time integrating your uh, your system. No, but this is more effective. What Wald did is that this is the smarter thing to do is to calculate the log likelihood, which is integrating for you the, the entire process. So what you have to do is to calculate the log likelihood of being L1 or being L2. And this is the smartest thing you can possibly do. And that's mathematics. So it's probably the best thing you can possibly do. So that's the best way of integrating your signal in time. That's the result of Wald. 
That's why Wald is quite non-trivial what he did. He's proving for you that that's the best way you can, you, you have to time integrate your, 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 your process. That's why I like it so much. One question, maybe. And the threshold is set by the, 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 the error rate that you want to have, yes. One more question while uh, Lucy is setting up. Uh, Mark. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. We decided that this was the quantity that we wanted to look at because it, it makes sense that the mean, at least for the cell in these cases, is the, is, the, is the right quantity, but that's, that's our fiat that we are looking at the mean, yes. In general, it could be something else. And not that I know, but it could, could have been done, but I haven't seen it. Just one more question. So this is, this is the optimal approach of the virus stack. Correct. And it is dynamic. Example of how things are designed for <laughs> I would guess you can still, you can still, uh, this probably still applies that the, you have to calculate the log likelihood taking into account the possible variations, but I haven't seen the proof of that. But my bet is that you still have to calculate the log likelihood of the two, taking into account the variation of possible variations of the environment. I have the gut feeling that this should still be optimal. The, yes, so it could get even more complicated to calculate practically, but I, I think it's still, it, it's going to be the quantity to be calculated, yes. I think you are missing again. And our next speaker is uh, Lisa Howard. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Okay. So um, I'm very excited to be here giving this talk. Um, thank you to the organizers for putting together this really interesting and eclectic meeting. Um, happy birthday, Bill. Uh, I wish I had a wonderful picture of Bill in the past, me talking to Bill, doing science at the blackboard, but I don't. Uh, actually, it turns out I don't have any pictures of me doing science or any pictures of Bill. <laughs> so it's kind of a fail on every level. Um, so yeah, we'll have to skip that part. Uh, but yeah, this is a really interesting meeting. Um, and yeah, I can only be here today in person. Um, I have a teething toddler who, uh, yeah, I have to be back and back at home to look after. Um, but I'm delighted to be here today and it's great to be able to watch the live stream uh, for the rest of the meeting. So I'm gonna talk about deep learning for protein function prediction and design. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of my trajectory. Um, there seemed to be some amount of sort of storytelling as part of this meeting. And so I hope I can at least join in that part of the sort of style. Um, so way back when I was in grad school, this was my kind of question that I wanted to answer. I was really interested in the connection between protein sequence and phenotype, protein phenotype or function. And so even, you know, this is sort of a really stupid toy example to try and illustrate the problem, but I wanted to understand what do the changes in sequence mean? How can we sort of understand proteins well enough to be able to sort of mess with the sequence, make changes and, and design new molecules? Um, I wanna know which sequence strategies control each phenotype and can we use natural variation and so embarrassingly, this, this is a slide actually from my thesis defense. Um, and I'm still obsessed with exactly the same questions. So I realize that I'm kind of myopically focused and haven't really changed what I do in a long time. So it was a bit of a surprise. I only found this slide earlier today and I was, I was kind of taken aback. Um, I do think these are interesting questions. Um, I hope that you, know, you, you also will think they're interesting questions. We've certainly seen some talks already in this meeting that have really touched on these questions that, that have been, at least for me, fascinating. So uh, this is, you know, 
sort of the, the, the more data rich version of the question. These are a bunch of hemoglobin sequences or parts of hemoglobin sequences from a bunch of different species. And if you look really carefully, the resolution isn't great, but if you look carefully, you can find pairs of amino acids that, that change at the same place in the alignment. And so there's a sort of correlation pattern here. Um, and so it's tempting to sort of think that, you know, perhaps um, the, these, these changes have some kind of functional effect. Um, of course, there's actually also a difference in the species at the top and the species at the bottom of the alignment and their primates at the bottom and, and other species at the top. So this could just be an accident of phylogeny. So there's a really nice sort of uh, mixing of signals here in this data. Um, and so for a long time, people have asked this question, how can we learn from evolutionary sequence data what constraints on the mutations that can be accepted are induced by the requirements of 3D structure and function of a protein. And so biologists have long noticed that you have compensatory mutations, so mutations at sites that are separate in the primary sequence, uh, but that you know, um, compensate for each other. And one hypothesis is that, is, is that that is in order is sort of to do with structural interactions. So there's a sort of toy model for, shown here where you have a loss of function mutant, you had a charge pairing that, that you know, involves two residues that are distant in sequence. You lose that charge pairing because of a mutation that happens, and that's a, it corresponds to a loss of function mutant. And then you get a functional double mutant where you had a compensatory mutation at a second site. And so of course, when that, if that were to happen, it would show up as a very strong correlation pattern in a sequence alignment. And so I've shown a sort of toy alignment at the bottom and highlighted this, this, this purported correlation. Um, and you know, for a long time, people asked, can we look at all these sequences and identify correlations in the sequence data and, and use that to make predictions about the amino acids, perhaps that are close in structure or that, that control function. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in my PhD studying in particular work of Rama Ranganathan, who had these hypotheses about uh, networks of residues and allosteric communication in proteins. And I, I still don't really understand all of this. And I think it's, it's fascinating, um, but, it, but it turned out, so I was lucky enough after my PhD to work with a really large group of people, it turned out that actually you can exploit these correlations and use them to build models that, that, that tell us about the 3D protein structure. And so you do a very nice sort of correlation analysis um, that you can perhaps justify using some sort of arguments from statistical physics. Uh, and you end up, you start with sequences in a large alignment, you end up with pairs of amino acids that are close in 3D structure. And that turns out to be enough information to actually fold up the proteins. So these are, these are all really old slides, but it's kind of a nice finding. Um, and this is unsupervised. And of course, since then, um, so actually what was nice is we made some predictions back in 2012 that, that actually, uh, these were de novo predictions. They've actually been borne out in, 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 since then in experiments. Um, but of course, you know, we have this enormous success of alpha fold, which is a supervised version of this problem, that I think really takes sort of the next step and does a much better job at extracting that information from protein sequences. Um, and so AlphaFold is doing something really very interesting, this, this new AlphaFold version two, in that it, it, it learns, at least as far as I can tell, by, by the end of the process, you learn this, this, this embedding of the sequence alignment that, that really contains all the information necessary to specify the structure. So you end up with sort of a, an object a representation that, that is very rich that contains that structural information. And so I suppose that idea of learning a representation or embedding is something that I want to spend some time talking about today. Um, it's sort of an idea that I'm fascinated by, I'd like to explore more. I'm less obsessed, honestly, with the idea of predicting structure. So I think it's a, it's, it's a noble task. People have spent a lot of time doing it. Um, it's great that AlphaFold works so well. Somehow, being able to predict structure really accurately doesn't strike me as, as, as the big problem. So I guess I think that predicting function is, is much more potentially useful. And so I'd really like to understand the mapping between amino acid sequence and function. And we certainly have lots and lots and lots of sequence data, right? So there's billions of sequences, protein sequences in the database that we can exploit. If we can only figure out how to decode this information, we should be able to move beyond structure and really be able to make predictions about function. Um, this is you know, an, an important challenge. There's a paper here from 2018, which states 
in the opening of the abstract that a third of all protein genomes, uh, protein coding genes from bacterial genomes can't be annotated with function. Um, if you speak to people in the field, they'll actually state that's a massive underestimate. So there's many, many, many sequences that we simply can't annotate with function. We have no idea what these proteins do. We've collected all the data, we've sort of spent invested resources in, in, in collecting all of this data, and yet we just don't know what these proteins do. So among these, there could be like, you know, incredible tools for use in biotechnology, um, uh, cascades of enzymes that are capable of producing novel therapeutics, like all sorts of useful molecules, and we just, we simply don't know what they are. So I'd like to be able to build models that capture the relationship between protein sequence and phenotype, and, and, and somehow that learn a representation that, you know, maybe is, has some similarity to that representation that alpha fold was learning, but is less attuned on just being able to, to predict structure, but rather contains information about function as well. And so, you know, this is a, an image from a paper from 2006. Um, uh, it's not my paper. Uh, and I think the idea here is that there are sort of groups of proteins or families, if you like, um, in, in this space, and they're sort of separated. Um, and you can move around in this space and, and, and be able to, 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 to systematically make changes in sequence um, that, that, that have desired, specific desired uh, functional effects. Um, and so, yeah, I sort of imagine once you have the sequence embedding, you can use it in order to optimize specific aspects of particular proteins. And there are some examples, some protein design experimental collaborations that we've worked on uh, well, we've explored this, um, probably won't have time to talk about them today because I'd like to sort of focus on learning this, this representation, uh, but, but it's a, certainly an interesting area. Uh, but essentially, you know, we have billions of sequences. It would be great to be able to really capture the relationship between protein sequence and functional properties or phenotypes um, and thereby reduce sort of experimental data collection requirements and, and, and transfer models and learnings between proteins to enable zero shot design. So, you know, you might've read recently about uh, enzymes that can break down PET for use in plastic recycling, right? There's quite a lot of um, advance has been made in enzymes that specifically break down PET. But if you look at other types of plastic like PLA or any of the, the many types of plastic that we use every day, we have no solution for that. So we have no candidate enzymes. We, we, we simply don't know how to, how, to, how to design such a protein and how to make it work. So that's the kind of problem I imagine we could tackle if, if we understood this better. Yeah, and so what's nice is you can then run a kind of active learning loop where you uh, start by synthesizing specific sequence variants, measure their activity for whatever task you're interested in in the lab, and then build models uh, and, and, and optimize those models in silico and then synthesize the next batch of sequence variants. So there's a whole kind of loop here. You can go round and round this loop. This actually works quite well in specific examples, um, but it would work better if we had a more informative sequence embedding. Maybe that's the goal. And so I'm gonna sort of focus on this first question of using deep models to learn embeddings. And we started working on this task by asking whether we could annotate protein sequences more accurately than state-of-the-art methods such as BLAST and, and HAMMER without needing alignment. So alignment is a computationally expensive task. Um, if you have run BLAST in the, in the web server, you'll know that you have to wait minutes even to get a response. So you put your sequence into the web server and you sit there and kind of wait for a while and eventually it comes back with results. That's because it, it, it's, you know, it's optimized, but it's, it's not that fast. And so if I want to run many, many, many BLAST queries, I, it actually really just takes a long time. I think we ran BLAST for a whole month at some point in order to get data for, for, for PFAM full, which is 15 million sequences. Um, it just takes a long time. Um, Hammer also takes, takes, takes a, if you wanna run Hammer many, many times, it also is computationally expensive and it takes a long time. So if we can avoid this alignment step, it would be a significant compute saving. Um, and so, yeah, our goal here was to learn sequence representations or embeddings from raw unaligned sequences uh, and where proximity in that learned embedding space somehow encodes functional activity. So we're gonna start with uh, a, a task where we take to start with pre-cut domain sequences. So proteins contain what's called functional domains. 
the domain is kind of the, the part of the protein that, that, that is conserved across evolution. So you see sort of proteins being made out of, of, of different combinations of the domains, but domains are sort of the, 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 the key piece. Um, and we're gonna build a model and, and set up a classification task where we predict which PFAM family a domain comes from. We use PFAM version 32 for this. Um, it's the, a database that's freely available online. The full version of PFAM is built using hidden Markov models that are fit on seed family. So you have sort of small amounts of data that have been carefully curated for every family um, so that you can build models. Uh, you build profile each of them using those small human sort of curated alignments and then use those models to kind of pull in many more sequences and, and annotate many more sequences. So our sort of thinking here was that PFAM full is, is basically, you know, we'd be learning an HMM and that isn't what we want to do. So we should focus on PFAM seed because this is at least human curated um, and, and, and sort of human verified. And it's about one and a half million protein sequences. So it's actually a relatively small data set because there's something like 18,000 families. So if we have one and a half million sequences, there's not that many sequences in each family. And in particular, we have a lot of very small families, which is a you know, reasonably difficult challenge for, for a deep learning. So we had a really broad distribution of lengths and we also had a really uh, broad distribution of family sizes. Uh, we had many, many, many small families and a few very large families. So we set this up as a classification task. We built uh, a pretty straightforward uh, deep learning model. This is a ResNet. Um, basically, all that it does is take in the amino acid sequence. Um, we use a one hot encoding, and then we, we learn a representation of that sequence. So we learn a fixed length representation for every single sequence. So 1100, that was a choice. I actually don't think that we varied that as a hyperparameter. We could have varied that to ask, you know, what length works best, but 1100 seemed to work pretty well. We used a whole set of convolutional layers to learn this model. We could, we also used, trained RNNs. We could train lots of different types of model. Um, but these, these, these convolutional layers that made use of dilated convolutions work pretty well. Um, and so once we have that representation, we can use it to, 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 to predict which class the sequence belongs to uh, and then ask, you know, you update the model um, according to whether we got that correct or not. And so this is sort of a, 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 a representation of the learned, well, it's a, a principal component analysis of the, of the learned representation. I was going to say a representation of the learned representation, but that was getting a bit complicated. Um, and so if this model worked perfectly, right, all members of a class would, would end up at a single point in this, in this PCA. And so we get this sort of grouping um, and it turns out we can actually use that representation very simply to just classify sequences. And so, you know, we, we compared our model very carefully to existing approaches in the field. Um, this chart shows error rate on a log scale as a function of distance from the training data. So you have to be really, really careful here. The training data we're dealing with is not IID, right? So sequences can be very, very similar because they're closely related by evolution. And we've made a random split. So, you know, we've taken, uh, 10% of our data and use it as a dev set and we took 10% and use it as a test set. So we had 126,000 sequences in our test set, right? But some of those sequences are very, very close to the training data. And so the model can just memorize, right? And so that, that doesn't, that's not impressive at all, right? We, we don't really care about that. Uh, but some of our sequences are very far from the training data. And so that's why we stratify performance here by the distance uh, from the training data. So you can see the models all do much worse. On the left-hand side, the errors are higher. Uh, on the right-hand side, they generally do better. Um, and we trained a, the, the, the CNN I talk, told you about, this PROT CNN model. Um, that does reasonably well at this task. Um, it, 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 it does overall beat the HMM, but actually the HMM is, is really doing very well for those distant sequences. And we found that if we trained an ensemble, I think in this plot, an ensemble of 19 CNNs, then we could comprehensively sort of beat the baseline with statistical significance um, across all of these bins. And so, yeah, the HMM model is making close to 2000 errors and we're making something like 200. Um, and so uh, at this point we felt that uh, we really had done better. You could easily make these models better. We, we constrained ourselves so that every CNN was set, fit on a single GPU. Um, that was an artificial constraint we, we, we introduced because we wanted them to be kind of usable by people. Um, if you make the model bigger and bigger, it will do better and better, basically. So um, I don't think that's... We also, we built a clustered split because uh, re remote homolog detection is really important. 
Um, so we split every family so that every test sequence was at most 25% identical to any train sequence. This is you know, a much harder task. Um, we made a train dev and test split. And again, our ensemble was able to outperform the HMM, uh, but here the, uh, the single CNN is, is, is struggling a bit more. So the HMM is doing better than quite a lot of the, the buckets. Um, so we also we then asked, you know, can we actually just use this learned embedding space, right? We, we, we put all this energy into learning this representation. Can we exploit the representation itself uh, to, to, to carry out classification? And so all we did was to compute the, the average learned representation or some kind of sentinel for each family across its training sequences. So we have a kind of a single representative for each family built from the training data. And we can then classify every held out test sequence by finding which of these um, sentinels or markers it's closest to. So that's a very, um, there's a, a, an, an approach that doesn't require any more compute than the, the, the original CNM model, um, but it turns out it does do better, quite a bit better, especially for small families. So here I've stratified performance by family size, um, and you can see that the, the HMM is actually doing the very best for the smallest family, those with less than 17 training sequences, um, but, but our representation, our sort of embedding based model is, is, is kind of getting closer to its performance. Um, it also turned out that the deep learning models really were actually learning something different to the existing approaches. So we found if we ensemble them, we made a very simple ensemble where basically we, we trust as, as long as they agreed, we took the prediction and where they differed, we sort of enforced confidence thresholds basically. And we, if we combine uh, the hidden marker model with our ensemble, then the combination of the two actually does quite a bit better than either of the models on their own. Um, in contrast, if your ensemble the hidden market model and blast, then the performance doesn't, doesn't change at all. And so with that approach, we found that we could actually uh, annotate significantly more sequences than were currently available in PFAM. And so we added something like, I think, 8 million sequences to the database. And so this was released, um, I believe, last year in 20, 2021. So before, before we published this work, we, we made this release with PFAM um, adding a whole lot of sequences to the database. So we, we next asked, you know, can we pre-train models um, in order to take advantage of the abundance of sequence data that exists, right? Like we have billions and billions of sequences. We can train using a sort of a self-supervision task where we delete elements of sequences and try and predict them back, right? So that's what's shown on the left-hand side here. This model is trained to, to sort of predict back where the question mark is. And then we can take that model and, 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 and sort of freeze the weights essentially, and then train a classifier on top of it. And so we can kind of keep all that knowledge that it's learned by being able to fill in the gaps um, and sort of use it to, to, to warm start the classifier. Um, and so this was a very simple sort of application of, of a, a model called BERT that was published in the, in the NLP literature. Um, and as I, I sort of said, we trained it as a denoising autoencoder. Um, and it turns out that, so this is showing what happens for different models, the accuracy on that clustered split. So we have a prot TNN is, is the name that we gave this model. If we train it from scratch, then it does quite a bit worse than if we, if we, tra if we, if we first pre-train it and then fine tune. So we've tried to train both one layer and 12 layer models, um, either you know, from scratch on the classification task or with the pre-training, and you can see that that 90% result uh, in the second last row kind of does quite a bit better uh, than the 74% above, which is a 12 layer model uh, trained from scratch. If we make a small ensemble of those models, then we can, we can do even better. Um, there are reasonably no large number of parameters in these models. However, what's surprising to me is that there's actually even more parameters in the set of HMMs that makes up PFAM. So there's something like 194 million parameters in those HMMs, Whereas our, our transformer, our 12 layer transformer actually only has 99 and a half million parameters, um, which you know, is kind of at least a smaller number. <laughs> so, anyway, so it, it does a bit better. This is now showing accuracy. I've, I've confused things by switching the axis. This is accuracy as a function of distance from the training data. So the purple line is, is, is a little bit higher than actually any of the other lines. Um, and and, and it, does, it does a bit better overall. Um, in particular for small families, the HMM is still beating us, which is kind of annoying, but we're getting, we're getting closer, we're closing the gap. 
Um, and so, uh, of course, what I've been doing all this time is working with pre-cut domain sequences, which is kind of cheating because you have to use the HMM to cut them. When I say cut them, you know, you have a full amino acid sequence that, that corresponds to a protein, and you need to find the domains in the sequence. So this is actually really like a, a computer vision problem that people work on a lot, where they look at, they, they, I try to identify objects in images, and they, 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 they define bounding boxes, and they don't identify bounding boxes. Um, and so it, you know, there are lots of um, approaches that you can use for this. We've actually used a very, very simple approach to start with, which is simply that we make a, a prediction for every single residue in the full sequence, uh, rather than for the pre, working with the pre-cut domain. We find that if we do that, then we actually do a really good job of, of finding the domain boundaries accurately. Um, and so that means we can kind of perform the whole task, which I think is, is an important uh, modification. And so we were able to use this approach uh, in collaboration with the Magnify database at e EMBI, yeah, EBI, which is the metagenomic database, which has something like 2.8 billion sequences in it. Um, we were able to provide labels for one and a half billion sequences, which was about 200 million proteins more than they could annotate using the approaches they had. So um, this was a, a, a silly GIF that my colleague made. I didn't know how to make these things. Um, but the idea was to show that, you know, we could really label a larger set of sequences. Uh, and it, 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 this, this takes much less time and compute to carry out than, than running the HMMs and PFAM across all of this data. But our models are able to annotate more, more sequences because they can reach further into sequence space. So the HMMs, you know, they, they, if you, at some point you just simply can't align sequences, like they're too distant to be able to align them. Um, and that, that doesn't sort of trouble our models, but it, but it does trouble uh, the existing approaches. And so that's where that improvement comes from. So, oh, wow, I, I have just a few minutes left. And it's good because I have just a few slides left. Um, so far, I've talked a lot about a closed domain task, right? Classification, we're trying to predict which of an existing set of classes a protein belongs to. But that's kind of silly because what we really need to do is discover new classes, right? There's protein sequences out there. We don't know what they do. Probably there are some of them that, that do completely new things that we've never seen before. So we need to be able to build models that can do that too. And so we sort of turn to these uh, language models with the idea that they might be able to translate between amino acid sequences and English text. Um, and this is a sort of adaptation of an image from uh, the, 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 a paper that introduces T5 model. Um, and I've replaced, this is a prompting language model, I've replaced the text here with sort of protein facts. But the idea is that you train this model, which is a transformer based model across many, many tasks and you have a prompt which kind of tells it which task you're working on when you give it a, any, any given input. So here you'd give it a protein sequence together with a, a, a prompt that tells it, oh, it's task one or task two or task three. And so that way the model can share the information between all these tasks and, and sort of aggregate it and therefore perform better at any one given task. And so we first carried out a proof of concept exercise where we trained this language with one of the tasks being the, the PFAM task I've talked about so much. Uh, in, the, in this talk. Um, we also trained it to be able to predict PFAM family descriptions, which are free text descriptions, and uh, PFAM family IDs, which again is a classification task. Uh, and so it turns out that it does very well at the straightforward classification task. So it does slightly better even than our, our pre-trained transformer I talked about earlier. But what we really want to be able to do, of course, is to generate these, these descriptions. And so if we look at the description outputs, which is the middle line of this table, it, it's doing pretty well, right? It has an accuracy of 88 percent, which is, which is close to, 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 to our sort of state of the art. And, and in fact, the, the, family, the, the family accession result there is even slightly better than the, the previous result. Um, but, but the problem here is that we want the model to, just, to generate new description. The whole point is, if, is, if, is for it to tell us things that we didn't know, right? We want it to be able to, to really um, innovate. And, and we're measuring exact maps. So we're measuring cases where it exactly reproduces the, the PFAM provided description. So we're, we're kind of missing the point. Um, yeah. Um, so essentially, you know, we had something like 300 descriptions that were never seen during training. Some of these are clearly nonsense. Um, some of them are, are really viable family descriptions. Uh, and, and it's really hard, right? Like as a, as a human, you can see that this is indeed a dog cat from your fridge, right? You can validate very easily. But this, like, is this really a capsid protein VP1, right? Like, you know, if we could tell that, then we'd sort of, we wouldn't need to build this model, 
right, in some sense. I mean, that's the whole problem is that we, we can't do a good job of reading amino acid sequences. So, so validating these is hard. Um, to do that, we have basically been working with the curators um, at Uniprop, which is another big database. Um, and essentially, the curators are really quite happy with the, the, the names that our model produces uh, to the extent that, I think this is really my last slide, they're going to release 49 million protein annotations uh, in October. Um, and so these are annotations for proteins that were previously called uncharacterized protein, which is like not a particularly insightful name. And those are, all those proteins are going to have new names that have been generated uh, by these models. Um, and we obviously haven't checked all 49 million. And so I'm quite worried that lots of people are going to kind of uh, point out the ones that are, that are wrong. Uh, on, uh, I think it's October 12th that this comes out, but hopefully some of them will be correct and useful. Um, and a lot of this work was done, so I've been on secondment at Google Research for quite a bit of time, and a lot of this work was done in close collaborations with, with colleagues at Google. Um, and so that's why uh, you can see that Uniprot's gonna prefer every other way of generating a name uh, above us in, the, in this hierarchy, but there is gonna be a Google line in, in, that, in that hierarchy. And if they have nothing else, they will use our name, um, which I don't know. Uh, we certainly didn't think that would happen when we started this project, and so uh, I'm very excited. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry I probably ran over slightly. We more than have to take any questions. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of an unfair question, but I, I'm curious about the response, which is that suppose you annotate a protein and you discover it's a transcription factor, or you discover that it's a serine kinase or a GCPR protein. What people really want to know are the targets of these proteins yeah. and where they're involved. And the, but so that information is, is perhaps not as useful as we might want. Yeah. Um, are there any plans for moving beyond that? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, can, can, I, I'm sorry, I just flipped to this extra slide. Can we predict more than protein name? Yes. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, obviously, we can also turn the model on its head, right? Like, I want a GPCR. I want a GPCR that that binds this particular ligand. Like, please, can you give me? Uh, the corollary of that question is that uh, you know, in the area where I work, there are these kinesin proteins. By and large, that on the average, less than twenty-five percent similarity from one to the next. Yep. Um, so they're deucedly hard to find. And even if you do find them, you don't know what they're good for. Uh, this is a real problem. And that's a problem we want to be able to solve. So, um, you know, these models are very complicated and, 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 and large, but they really can see further in sequence space than, 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 than previous models. And I say that mainly because our colleagues at EBI have told us that. You know, I, I can say that doesn't mean much, but like if... if if Alex says, Alex says that, then, then Alex is our colleague at EBI, then, then it means a great deal. And so I think this really will be able to push that frontier so that we can analyze, uh, annotate, and both annotate many, many more sequences, but also, as you say, annotate them more richly, right? Like we should be able to generate whole paragraphs of text about each protein um, using these kind of models. And so I think, you know, we haven't done that yet, but I think that really is kind of going to be interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you, you, your prior work was had very specific physical hypotheses that were fit to your very precise, sharp algorithms. Do you have thoughts now about how you might interrogate these neural net models to ask sort of the more physical terms what they're basing their deci quote decisions on? Yeah, no, I, I think I think it's a great question. And I think yeah, there are many approaches that, that we're sort of both actively exploring and also interested in exploring to, 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 to addressing this. I mean, one thing is, you know, this, this idea of turning the model on its head so I can ask it to give me sequences with specific activity. If I can ask it to give me very many sequences that, that bind a particular ligand or, 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 or you know, ha, ha, catalyze a particular reaction, then I can start to understand something about the set of sequences that solves that problem, right? So this is where I'm asking it in English and it's giving me an amino acid sequence back. So if I generate huge sets of amino acid sequences, I can start to understand what are the, the motifs or the features that the model is believes corresponds to that activity. So then I can really get to that question, which amino acids in the sequence control phenotype for, for, for different phenotypes, right? And again, this is all hypothetical. Like I, I haven't, you know, we haven't done this, but, but, it, but it should be possible. And of course, there's also many attribution approaches that we can use to try and understand the model um, um, by, by sort of going, you know, differentiating back through it basically. 
um, or by perturbing the inputs or yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I mean, the kind of, you know, Judith gave us this, this beautiful demonstration yesterday in her talk um, of, of really careful understanding, right? And, and it, it, it would be amazing if the models could help us with that kind of endeavor, right? I have no idea if that would be possible, but that would be cool. Yeah. It depends on what? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I I don't I don't have a good answer to that at the moment. Um, there's also sort of comp like you know I sort of hid some of the detail. Like when we get to the per residue models, we have an embedding for every residue. And actually, what's kind of neat is that the, the a protein then ends up being kind of a curve in embedding space, which which doesn't have to be the case, but but empirically turns out to be the case. Um, but yeah, I, there's lots of questions here. I don't know the, the answer. Thanks. Oh, all right. Thanks. Our third speaker of the afternoon. Thank you. Is Michael Desai. Michael, take it away. Thanks, Thierry. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks for putting uh, all of this together. Um, it's a great, uh, great to see folks again. And because I know we're all having a good time, I'll be sure to run way over so we can spend more time together. Um, not really. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about a much sort of smaller and more focused uh, parts of sequence space. But uh, we're going to what I'm going to talk about is recent work in my lab. Uh, in collaboration with Alex, Thierry, and, and a bunch of others um, to understand binding affinity landscapes that are responsible for the evolution of broadly neutralizing anti-influenza antibodies. And if I have time, I'll also talk a little bit about the evolution of the BA1 Omicron variant that we've all become familiar with, uh, some of us very familiar with over the past nine months or so. Um, before I get into that, a little prequel, I actually haven't done a ton of science in the past couple of years um, because uh, I actually spent a lot of the last couple of years um, uh, building and running um, this uh, uh, CLIA testing lab, basically, to do all of the PCR uh, testing for Harvard and MIT. Um, so Bill knows this very well. I was supposed to spend a lot of the last couple of years helping him write this decadal survey. Uh, instead, I was constantly saying, sorry, uh, I'm running some COVID tests. We ran uh, almost 3 million COVID tests over the past year. And I'm happy to tell you uh, if you guys have a spare 10, 15 hours sometime uh, <laughs> about all of the fun that, that, that was had uh, in doing so. Hmm? Well, it was interesting. I mean, a lot, obviously. <laughs> when we started, we started this, like we spent $7 million to set up the lab and it was gonna be this huge failure uh, because COVID was gonna be over. And then, you know, so the first several months we had like almost no positives. You know, we'd run like 10,000, 15,000 tests in a day and we might get like five positives or something like that. But fortunately for us, <laughs> we had Delta and then we had Omicron and anyway, so um, we got to positive rates at the worst of like over a percent, like a percent and a half maybe for short periods of time. But uh, for, the, for the most part, it was pretty low anyway. Sorry. <laughs> It was, it was, it was, it was quite fun. Yeah, we, anyway, I, I got a lot of stories about this, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell them. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> we could just not talk about science and talk about this, but actually, so when we started this, I had this whole plan to sequence all the positives and for a while we did. And then the lawyers got a different, they came up with a different interpretation of the consent. Um, and it turned out that then under their revised guidance, we had to reconsent everybody and it was to, to sequence. So we actually had to stop all the sequencing. And for a while we tried to reconsent people, but it just became impossible because like you just told these people that they're COVID positive, they got to go into quarantine, whatever the last thing they want to do is deal with consent forms and so on. And so we wound up 
basically not sequencing the vast majority of the stuff. So there's no, there's no data, there's no science. It's just, we told people to go not, not see their friends. Um, anyway, um, that's a whole other subject. Um, I, I learned a lot about the FDA and about all kinds of legal interpretations and so on of different things. Uh, and I ran a lot of uh, PCRs. But um, anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, affinity binding landscapes for broadly neutralizing anti-influenza antibodies, as I mentioned. And so, as most of you know, uh, affinity maturation is this kind of fascinating evolutionary process that happens whenever you get sick or when you get vaccinated. Basically, B cells uh, uh, express uh, various kinds of uh, essentially random, specific kind of random uh, antibody sequences. And then when you get sick or you get vaccinated, there's this process of somatic hypermutation where you generate variation. Uh, these variants are then sort of exposed to antigens. And if they don't bind to anything, they get killed. If they do bind, then they can become plasma cells or memory cells or undergo subsequent rounds of hypermutation and subsequent selection. And so you get this evolutionary process and uh, most of you know, you've got, you get the flu shot every year or you get sick uh, from time to time. Uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> one of the problems with this is that viral proteins that infect us like this hemagglutin in here, which is the primary target of antibodies against influenza, uh, they evolve rapidly and that can limit the, the ability of our immune system and the antibodies that we've developed in previous years in response to previous vaccines or infections uh, from binding to the flu. So this is a sort of rough phylogeny of all of the major sort of groups of influenza. Uh, and there's a huge amount of variation, particularly in the head of the hemagglutinin across this, which limits the binding. Okay, so most of the time when you get sick or you get vaccinated, you develop immunity to a very specific, like, you know, you might develop, let's say, to one particular strain within this H1 group here. But uh, we can identify more broadly neutralizing antibodies. And the way that people have done this essentially take people that have been vaccinated and basically screen, uh, screen their blood for antibodies that bind broadly. Okay, and we'll talk about two specific such broadly neutralizing antibodies. One is called CR9114, which is, I think, the most broadly neutralizing anti-influenza antibody ever identified. It binds basically all this stuff, may even bind to some extent uh, influenza C and D. Um, and then uh, this 6261, which basically just binds the group one, um, still extremely broad antibody, but much less broad than this guy. Okay. And so we know something about the co-crystal structures of the, basically how these things bind. They, they're basically broad antibodies because they bind the stem of hemagglutinin rather than the head, and the stem is more conserved. That's the bottom line. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to make, so these, these antibodies, they start from some germline sequence. They acquired a bunch of mutations. Okay, we'll talk about what those mutations are in a moment uh, in uh, evolving during this process of somatic hypermutation and selection. And what we're gonna do is basically make all possible combinations to sort of make these landscapes and then ask like, are they additive? Are they highly epistatic? Are there constraints in how these uh, antibodies must have evolved, okay, to acquire breadth? So, here is the germline sequence. Uh, both CR 9114 and 6261 started from essentially, well, not exactly the same, but very similar germline sequences. And then through that process of hypermutation and selection, the CR9114 uh, accumulated 16 mutations in the heavy chain, okay, which are identified here, and 6261, 11 mutations in the heavy chain here, which I'm gonna focus on. And basically what we did is for both of these two, we made all possible combinations of the 16 or 11 mutations through this process, basically you, you it's straightforward to do. You, you make fragments of pieces of it and you combinatorially assemble them. And so we produced all of the variants, two to the 16 for 9114 and two to the 11 for uh, 6261. And then we used this um, method, which was developed by Reese Adams in collaboration with Alex and Thierry, uh, and I believe Justin Kinney, um, 
to measure the binding affinities of all of these uh, variants to various different strains of, of, of hemagglutinin. And so basically what we did is you take this library, you transform them into yeast. Each yeast expresses one particular antibody. Then you add some antigen at some concentration and basically it binds to the antibodies on the surface of yeast if that particular antibody binds that particular antigen. Then you sort by, based on the fluorescence, which sort of tells you how much antigen is bound to a particular cell. And then you can sort of figure out basically how much binding there is to each of these, you know, two to the 16 or two to the 11 sequences in parallel. And you get, you do this at a bunch of different concentrations and you get a binding curve. And we did this for representative antigens uh, for group one, group two, and flu B for 9114 and two different group one flu A antigens for 6261, just as a sort of a representative examples here. Okay. This basically works, okay? I don't wanna talk in detail about the experimental uh, validation, but basically you get very good estimates of binding affinities. And so what I'm gonna talk about now then is this, these, these two uh, landscapes. So here is what we see for 9114. And the reason I'm talking about this uh, in public uh, as opposed to just binning it in private is that, is that when we did this landscape, I had really no idea what to expect. Um, but what you see is really quite striking, at least to me. So this is these, these there's 62, this, well, whatever, six, what's two to the 16? So I feel like somebody here should know, 65,000, whatever it is. Uh, there's 65,000 some points here, one for each uh, possible variant. I've colored them by the number of mutations. So the sort of uh, yellower that you are here, the closer you are to the mature somatic version of the antibody. And what I, these three axes are the binding affinity to H1 here, which is the uh, group one, H3, which is a representative group two, and then flu B, a particular strain of flu B. And you see this kind of striking orthogonality of the landscape, okay? Where, you know, it looks like first you kind of got, uh, um, you, you can do worse than the germline, but you accumulate a few mutations, you bind H1 well, and then a few more and you start to bind H3 and then even more and you, you bind flu B. And the somatic version is here. There are things that are better than the somatic, uh, mature somatic antibody. Okay. On, in contrast, when you do 6261, you see this very strikingly different landscape, okay? Where it looks like you can kind of get, gradually get affinity to both, okay? So we can uh, quantify this landscape in various ways. Uh, you can sort of model the KD in terms of the binding affinities in terms of you know, orders of interactions and epistasis. What I'm gonna show instead is a sort of low dimensional visualization method that uh, postdoc Toma Dupic in my lab uh, uh, um, identified. So basically the way this is gonna work is we've got all these points which represent different genotypes at for the 914 16 different loci and what we're going to do connect all neighboring genotypes with lines essentially and then give the line a weight which is basically like one over the difference in binding affinity and then pull things together according to this weight so this is going to tend to group genotypes that are related and that have similar binding affinity okay and so this is what you get when you do this. And I'm gonna actually try to show this in real time and probably screw up. Okay, so you, you can go to this you know, on your own computer if you like, it's all public. Let's see if the internet works as well. Okay, it takes a minute to load. Okay, here we go. So, uh, so what do I wanna do here? All right, share this, all right. Yeah. I mean, people can just go and look. All right, here we go. Okay, so what you can do here are the 16 different mutations and you can like color the landscape. So let's see. Okay, no, I should have done. Okay, let's do this one. Okay, this is a mutation that kind of doesn't matter because basically if I color the landscape by this mutation, it, you know, you can see that the points don't separate, right? And points are gonna tend to be pulled together if they have similar binding affinity. So mutations that don't affect things kind of look like this. And here is another example. 
of a mutation that has a dramatic impact on the landscape, right? Because it sort of, it structures the landscape, right? And you can see, but you can see that it sort of has a funky behavior where in some cases it increases the binding affinity, but also in other cases it decreases the binding affinity. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. We can look at other examples like these guys. And anyway, it's fun to sort of play with this uh, and you can really sort of see this high dimensional landscape um, and, and understand the structure. But what I'm gonna do now is just go back and give you the carefully curated version of this because obviously we spent some time looking through it. What we find is that there are really five key mutations that structure this landscape. And they interact in these sort of highly epistatic ways, okay? This is, you can see that these five mutations sort of determine the structure. Whereas if I just pick five other random mutations, they don't really make any, they don't really do so. And so here are these five mutations, they sort of sit near where uh, this antibody binds to HA, okay? And sort of the story here, here's just an, an example of a story explaining what's going on. This mutation at 30, which was one of the ones that I showed you in that, in that landscape, basically it, if it occurs in the germline background, it really decreases the binding affinity. So it's bad in that context for the antibody because it causes the antibody to lose this contact, okay, with, with the hemagglutinin. Um, on the other hand, you can get these two other mutations shown in green, okay? And by themselves, they don't really do anything to the binding affinity, okay? But what they do is they sort of reorient this loop. And um, this, on the other hand, these two mutations create some new contact. And what you see is that in the presence of this mutation that orients the loop, you sort of remove this badness, okay, of this binding of that loss. And then in the presence of this additional contact, as well as this reoriented loop, now this mutation, which initially reduced the binding actually increases the binding. So you have this sort of complicated five-way interaction that's sort of both creating new contacts, reorienting the whole loop and, and, uh, and, and sort of rejiggering this contact. And so basically what this is doing is it sort of creates, um, overall this kind of orthogonal structure of this landscape where what you have to do is you get these five mutations, sorry, I've been doing it. You get several of these mutations, okay? Improve the binding to each one. And then by doing that, what you're able to do is then create a genotype that can be a starting point for binding H3 Okay, and then after you get eight of these different mutations, you can start to bind this foo B. And so it sort of seems like you have to evolve in this kind of sequential way to get anywhere. And in contrast for 6261, you can sort of evolve binding simultaneously. And so what it suggests is that these, this kind of extremely broad antibody, the way that you could, the only way that you can evolve it is through a combination of sort of sequential exposure to different antibodies combined presumably with a fair bit of luck in that the way in which you adapt to the first antibody has to provide, to the first antigen, has to pro create the mutations that sort of provide the opportunity to, uh, to, to, to bind to the, to the next one. Okay. So that's why you get this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, orthogonal landscape. There's some then obvious sort of follow-up questions that we're working on now. So um, <clears throat> one obvious question is why is this uh, antibody less broad? Is it because it's sort of missing key mutations or has it sort of gone down, down some path that prevent it from acquiring additional breadth. And so we're working on that using, you can imagine using the same kind of approach to do sort of mix and match chimeric libraries and explore this sort of now larger sequence space spanning the mutations involved in both antibodies. And we're also looking at a variety of other types of antibodies. So here's an example of CH65, which is a broadly neutralizing uh, head targeting antibody. And with Aaron Schmidt's lab, we're looking at uh, interactions that result in this very different kind of antibody acquiring breadth uh, in very different kinds of ways. All right, I wanna spend, how long do I have? 10 minutes or so? 
All right, I wanna spend, oh, but I promised to go over. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm not serious. All right, uh, I wanna spend the last few minutes talking about applying this kind of combinatorial library construction method to understand something about the evolution of our friend Omicron here. So you all remember probably around Thanksgiving of last year, Delta was everywhere, right? And then all of a sudden you got the evolution of this Omicron, okay? And the thing that was, one of the things that was really surprising to me about this at the time is that everybody had Delta. Nobody had this original sort of Wuhan strain anymore, okay? And, um, but yet when Omicron emerged, it was not closely related to Delta, okay? So it wasn't just that the sort of currently sort of widely circulating strain of COVID acquired some new mutations that allowed it to escape our immune response. That's what you might've expected to happen. Instead, it sort of came from way out of left field over here, okay? And uh, we got this sort of highly diverged lineage, okay? And, and why did that happen, okay? So, what we did is the same kind of game that I was just talking about with the antibodies. There are 15 mutations in the receptor binding domain of the Omicron spike protein relative to the ancestral Wuhan strain. Okay, here they are. Uh, there's a 15 in BA1, and then you know the BA2 has some others, uh, and there's some that are most of them are shared between BA1 and BA2. Anyway, now we're looking at BA4 and 5 and so on. But when we started this, those didn't exist yet. So we made all possible combinations of these to explore something about how did this thing evolve, okay? And what you find is this kind of funny thing. So as you acquire, so what we're doing is we're looking at then how do these things, so there's a variety of phenotypes that could be interesting. One of the ones that we focused a lot on was binding to ACE2. So ACE2 is the, the basically binding to ACE2 is how COVID gets into your cells. Okay, so you've got to bind ACE2, otherwise COVID's not gonna, not, gonna, not gonna make you sick. Okay, there's a lot of other phenotypes as well, which I won't have time to talk about, but, uh, but uh, this is one of what, which I will talk about. And one thing you can see is the, the, this is the Omicron strain. It binds ACE2 a little bit better than it's the ancestral Wuhan strain, the sort of original strain of COVID. But if you start to create intermediates between Wuhan and Omicron, you actually reduce the ACE2 binding, okay? And there's actually not, it's maybe not obvious from this plot, but there's not a uniformly uphill way to get from Wuhan to Omicron in terms of the binding to ACE2. And what seems to be happening is there's some sort of pattern of compensatory epistasis. These are the 15 mutations, okay? And each of these violin plots is the distribution of the binding affinities, the, the effect on binding affinity to ACE2 of that mutation across all the other backgrounds at the two to the 14 genotypes at the other loci. And I've highlighted here in blue, the effect on the Wuhan background and in red in the Omicron background. And what you can see is, that these mutations, many of them are actually fairly strongly deleterious, okay? And they're almost universally worse for ACE2 binding if the mutation happens in the Wuhan background than if it does in the Omicron background, okay? So somehow what's going on is each of these mutations individually is, is bad or at best kind of neutral for ACE2 binding when they happen in the ancestor, but it's like, okay or even good if it happens in the, in the Omicron background. Okay, oops. God, I can't do this. Okay, all right. And what specifically seems to be happening is a whole bunch of these mutations are involved in escape of antibodies, okay? So basically, Omicron makes us sick even if we've had the vaccine or been sick with earlier versions of COVID because they can, because some of these mutations cause antibody escape. But um, <clears throat> those antibody escape mutations tend to be bad, okay? So here, for example, is a mutation G496S, okay, which is responsible for escape for certain types of anti-COVID antibodies, okay? And in the ancestral background, it's strongly deleterious for ACE2 binding. But if you make these three other mutations, 
okay? Then it's no longer deleterious, okay? And here's another example of why 505H, which is actually not known to be involved in any kind of antibody escape. We don't really know what this is doing. Uh, but again, this is strongly deleterious in the ancestral background, but in the presence of these compensatory mutate of these mutations, it's no longer deleterious. So it's not just that you've got some mutations that improve ACE2 binding, but essentially what you're doing is you get some mutations that make the negative impact of the antibody escape mutations no longer negative. Okay. And in general, what we see is that these mutations that sort of are more involved in immune escape, okay, they tend to, basically, if you're not involved in immune escape, there's all kinds of stuff that's happening, but the mutations that are involved in immune escape typically are much less deleterious on the Omicron background than on the ancestral background for ACE2 binding, okay? And here's a more complicated story along those lines. Since I don't really want to keep you here, I'll skip that, but basically, that's the story. So I just want to take a minute to acknowledge folks that actually did all this stuff. So Angela is a postdoc who led most of this work. Um, she just started her lab like last week, uh, her own lab at UCSF. Thomas is, where is he? He's here. He's continuing a lot of this work. And Alif has done, led all the Omicron work along with Jeffrey, Catherine, Ivana on earlier work and, and Milo. I'll stop there. Yeah, for us. Uh, you mentioned at some point this polynomial parameterization of uh, epistasis, yeah. and then uh, you switch to visualization. Yeah. So, uh, did you go back to uh, polynomial? So, can you tell us how complex this polynomial landscape has to be? Roughly, how many non-zero coefficients? Should there be to uh, capture uh, this thing with certain accuracy? I forget the number of, I, you need a fifth order. Basically we do some sort of cross validation type thing to estimate the optimal, you know, the, the optimal order. Uh, for 9114, you need a fifth order, a fifth order model is optimal, um, which makes sense given like, I mean, we actually identified these five mutations. Um, but it's not just those five mutations. There's all kind of fifth order interactions. It's, I don't remember the exact numbers, but we could look it up, but it's a lot. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Um, can you, so, so this, is, this is really cool. The, the um, Omicron RBD results. Um, I was wondering if you could, is, like, does this, um, suggest anything to you about the potential for like radically new, um, uh, I, I guess I'm wondering if the evolutionary landscape, um, the, if the fitness landscape that you see suggests anything about the potential for radically new RBDs to arise um, by two different possible mechanisms, one being a persistent infection yeah. in a single person versus like person to person. Oh, thanks. I'm really glad you asked that question because I, I, I meant to talk about that um, and was going too fast and, and forgot to mention that. But yes, I mean, so that I think is exactly the point here, which is that, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, Omicron came way out of left field instead of emerging out of Delta. And why is that? This landscape, I think, tells us why that might have been, which is that it's sort of hard to imagine this kind of evolution happening in the context of a chain of acute infections, where presumably, you know, you've got to maintain good ACE2 binding all the time, right? You can't sort of go through this valley and... Um, on the other hand, you can imagine that in some sort of chronic infection, in perhaps in some sort of immunocompromised individual, you might have larger population sizes, maybe relaxed selection on binding to ACE2, although it's not really entirely clear. And presumably like treatment in a sort of sequential manner by a variety of different kinds of monoclonal antibodies, which would have then selected for this kind of 
you know, escape of these various different classes of antibodies. So it does to me suggest that, right, the reason this came out of left field is presumably because the need for these compensatory uh, mutations to uh, allow for the antibody escape mutations not to impede ACE2 binding means that it must, it, it had to have happened within a chronic infection. And obviously the chronic infections that had been around a long time at that point were not Delta infections. Delta was still recent. Um, so th that's what I think, but I mean, obviously that's sort of speculative, but. Okay, thanks. All right. Yeah. Oh. When you mean uh, chronic infection, like another hypothesis is that, you know, uh, we know it came from a part of the world where there's a very high prevalence of HIV. Uh, so does, does that agree with your story? The idea that maybe it's people who are just immunocompromised. So that yeah. they don't necessarily get chronic infection with SARS-CoV-2, but they can get multiply infected and reinfected. Very yeah, I mean, somebody that was chronically infected because they were immunocompromised in some way, whether that's HIV or for whatever other reason, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's also possible that it you know, has something to do with some animal reservoir. Um, but I, I, I think the sort of that, that sort of uh, chronic infection is the most compelling um, reason. And, and there's other evidence for it now that comes from other um, other lines of evidence. But yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, so it's a special pleasure to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, neurons, um, very different than the previous talk. And um, uh, in particular, if you look at the activity of large groups of neurons, as you already saw yesterday, uh, it's clear that you know, even with this small segment of about a hundred neurons and showing about a minute of the activity of these hundred neurons in the cortex of a monkey, um, trying to make sense of this, uh, which is the goal of uh, um, solving the neural code problem uh, is, is very challenging. And, and maybe the simplest version of how hard this is, is thinking about just you know, what happens in small snippets in time. And if you focus on one of these snippets and you think about the binary pattern that represents activity over hundred neurons, then of course the number of possible patterns is painfully big, even just for hundred neurons. And so if we are gonna make any headway in this, it's not about running a better experiment. We really need models to, to make sense of this. And so what I wanna try and uh, talk about today are two and a half, uh, I don't know, semi-principles about, about this. Um, one is going uh, to be a description of where we got in terms of trying to find the rules that govern uh, the code of large populations of neurons, and in particular, how well can we read this and describe the probability distributions of our activity patterns because the system is so noisy. Um, the other is going to go where um, it's usually very dangerous to go, which is trying to make some uh, notions of uh, claims or ideas about my, what the brain might actually do with these kinds of codes. And then uh, if time permits, I'll say something about trying to make sense of the rules of the actual networks that generate this code, trying to really link structure and function, um, you know, being envious of Thomas for so many years. So, um, Following Thomas, um, I'm going to talk about the start with the old slides. So I'm going to give our version of more is different. Um, but um, so this goes back to my time in, with uh, Michael and Barry and Bill in Princeton a million years ago. And uh, the starting point, trying to make sense of the structure of population codes, is you know you look at pairs of neurons. The correlation between neurons is typically weak. I mean, this is an example from these old days, but you find this in many other systems. The, this is the typical correlation between pairs, which is very weak. And if you go and try and estimate how much information neurons carry, you look at pairs. This is again from Michael's lab. Every dot here is one pair of neurons. The color of the dot is the kind of movie that the retina was presented with. And you see that typical pairs are very weakly uh, redundant in terms of the information they carry. And so um, the, this weak correlations were kind of puzzling for us. And, um, and thinking about this, we realized, you know, if you look at even small groups of about 10 or 20 neurons, um, things are not so weakly correlated anymore. So while for pairs, you might think you can ignore these correlations for groups of 10 or 20, it's not the case. And so if you discretize time like this and you look at the binary patterns, it turns out that ignoring the correlations will do a really bad job. And this is an example. 
again from the retina from uh, um, 16 years ago now, um, looking at the individual patterns of these 10 neurons on in the x-axis, you see the actual rate at which it occurs in the experiment on the y-axis is the prediction of a model that ignores the correlations and it makes orders of magnitude mistakes. And so we had to go to small world coffee to solve this. And then um, um, this is where we came with the notion that to try and make sense of what's going on, um, we need to find a way to put all these weak correlations together in, and, and try and see what they give. And this was given by the maximum entropy uh, distribution of this case, which looks suspiciously similar to an Ising model in physics. And so when we did this, it worked like magic for groups of 10 or 20 neurons. So this is the same data from before. Every dot is an individual pattern. The red dots are how well the pairwise maximum entropy model does in terms of predicting these individual patterns for test data. And since we've done this, this has been done in many different systems and it works very nicely in many places. The thing is uh, that you know, makes us especially happy is that if to try and really describe what's going on here, there are basically n squared things you need to worry about, which is a huge reduction from the exponential number you might worry about. So it seems like you have a great principle to, to solve how these things work. But if you scale up for 100 neurons, which took us a while to do, um, this is now with uh, Ronan Segev in Ben Gurion University, looking at 100 neurons and doing the same game for 100 neurons, which is rather painful to do numerically, um, you start seeing that the pairwise model is not doing a good enough job anymore. And this is evident by the fact that the red dots over here are not on the line anymore. And did, you know, there are more uh, substantial cases of, of, of this mismatch. And so if you need to uh, take into account higher order terms, it look, it's kind of a nightmare because the number of possible triplets or quadruplets you need to take into account uh, uh, is, is painful. And so um, you can't really hope to do all of them. So which one should you pick? Um, so we came up with some kind of a cheat, um, which I won't get into the details, but we can identify special kind of interactions of high order nature that you need to, need to put into the game. We call this the reliable interaction model. Um, and this did a really good job of, of uh, uh, modeling 100 neurons. This is now again, uh, plots for individual patterns over now over the binary patterns of 100 neurons. Every dot here is one in such pattern. X-axis is again, the data rate of how often you see that word in a long experiment. And now the Y-axis is the log likelihood ratio between the dot data and the model. So if the model is good, you should be at zero. And the blue funnel is the 99% in um, sampling noise just because of the size of the data. So if you're within the blue thing, everything is kosher and you can go to the beach and have a party. Um, so the, the independent model sucks. We just saw that before. The pairwise model is missing things. So you can see it's not on the right place. And this reliable interaction thing we came with, with you know, did a remarkably good job. And then we said, fine. So we have a principle for what's going on for 100 neurons. Uh, can we go further? And now things became uh, even more complicated. So one should be suspicious because every time we went up, um, things look different. So this is the more is different thing. And in particular, um, it's not clear how to expand these models, both numerically, it's very hard to learn these for, for on these scales. Um, but also, if you think about this, the space becomes such that no individual pattern of activity ever repeats. This is a Zen riddle for you. I mean, when you never see the same neural activity twice, what do you do? Well, you have to generalize somehow. And so we thought, I mean, there's an issue of how we might learn these codes, but maybe we should copy from someone who already did. And so we thought maybe we should copy something from the brain. So uh, here are the rules of the game. And uh, we said, well, from the models, we know already that in, for about hundred neurons, we needed some sparse set of high order things to, to make headway. The brain tells us that you know, whatever it's doing with these things, there's a lot of things that look kind of random in terms of connectivity and things are rather sparse. There's a lot of linear and nonlinear cascades in different places that you know, kind of repeat. Um, so that's kind of a hint of what you might want to use. And for machine learning, we know that if you deal with something that lives in high dimensional space, but its real nature is of much lower uh, uh, structure in terms of dimensions, as we know these distributions really look like, uh, taking a lot of uh, cuts or projections into this thing and trying to work with that is pretty useful, hence the whole uh, world of compressed sensing. And so we thought, let's put all of these together and maximum entropy gives us a nice, nice way to try and build these things together. 
And so what we said, said well, instead of thinking about farming rates or you know, pairwise correlations or triplet correlation, let's take random functions. So let's just take a group of neurons, give them random weights, um, put them all together, um, and then basically uh, feed whatever we get to some nonlinearity. So make the alpha here's random, hence the different the 50 shades of green, and the G is going to be some uh, nonlinear function. And, and in particular, I'm going to show you stuff with a, uh, basically a um, heavy side or threshold. And so we're going to take a lot of, of these kind of random um, projections, we call them, and see how far we can get. So we build basically a maximum entropy model, but now based on a large set of these random projections. And what we end up with is uh, something that you know, kind of is a close relative of the pairwise Ising model, but now we have an exponential distributions where there's, oh, the, for each of one of these uh, projections, there's a factor we need to learn. And graphically, you can think of this as that we took the whole population, as you can see here, hopefully you see my arrow going here. And then basically there's different, you know, subgroups you randomly picked and you thought, you asked me, you know, what did they do as a small collective? This works like magic. So this is now summary for cortical data from uh, Bruce Becchiani's lab at NYU and from Tony Mofshon's lab at NYU. The top is V1, V2 recordings. The bottom is uh, prefrontal cortex recordings when the monkeys were watching moving dots. Um, again, every dot here is an individual activity pattern. Uh, X axis is the rate in the data. Y axis is the agreement between the model and the data. So again, the independent model uh, it's just here for reference. The pairwise model is missing things. And this random projection model is as good as you can hope for. We're basically predicting the individual pattern with an accuracy, which is better than comparing two pieces of, of data from the experiment. This is how good these models are. And then when we go up to uh, uh, the largest population we had at the time, which is 170 neurons, we actually see, we can, you know, now you cannot really talk about the probability of individual patterns of 170 neurons because they never repeat. So you look at likelihood values for these 170 neurons. And so we can play with the number of projections that we use. Um, unlike pairwise model, or, um, you, know, you can pick as many projections as you can if you can actually learn the model. So, um, what I'm showing here is the likelihood value of, of the independent model, just for reference. This is the pairwise model. This is something called the care pairwise model that Gasper and company here played with adding higher order terms. Um, and this is the performance of these random projection models as a function of the number of projections. If you just had the number of pairwise terms, this is a, about 15,000. So this is this broken line on the right. Uh, and so we basically beat the pairwise model already with a few thousand uh, handful of projections. Um, what's nice about this is, is that, um, of course, if you needed more projections, it's easy to, to get more of them and see where it gets you. The other thing is that what I'm, it's hard to see here is that the orange line here is the result of many different choices of these random sets of projections. And uh, the arrow bar is actually smaller than the size of the dots. I mean, this is how good it is. You just basically pick your set of projections and you're gonna be perfect with that. Um, so this made us very happy and there's a lot of stuff that you can do with this, which I'm just gonna talk about what you could do and not tell you what we did. Um, so you can learn a metric if you have such good models over the space of patterns in the spirit of the thing that David Tank mentioned yesterday. So we can actually try and learn something about the semantic structure of this space, which is pretty cool. We can actually do that and use that to do better decoding. And you can use that to also try and learn a metric on the space of stimuli, which is another interesting story, which uh, I'll tell you about if you're completely bored uh, sometime late at night. So um, what I wanna try and, and add is, is the really nice feature of this model beyond just saying, well, I have a good model for large populations because um, you know, we didn't escape our intention and many of you probably noticed this along the way is that uh, there's something kind of very familiar about this kind of description of what's going on. If I want to try and understand a model or build a model for the um, activity patterns of 100 neurons, which are depicted here with the black dots over the populations of cells, um, what I'm doing is you know, creating these uh, sets of random projections, which I drew here as kind of these colorful blobs. Um, there's an immediate interpretation of this in something we've all seen too many times we care to uh, think about. So 
If we think about this group of neurons that I want to build the model for, um, I can now take these random projections as basically another layer of neurons that are just all computing a randomly set perceptron over these in, uh, um, input neurons. And then I have one readout neuron that needs to figure out how to put these together. What's nice about this is that here, the first layer is completely random. I pick it out of my hat, I freeze it, I never touch it again. All I need to do is to learn just the weights of the readout neuron. So no credit assignment problem, no backpropagation headaches. This is as simple as you can get. And what it gives you is a circuit that basically compute the log likelihood of its input. It computes the surprise of what it just saw. Why should you care? Well, there's a lot of ideas about neurons in the brain computing likelihood of things. Uh, but here in particular, if we have a circuit that can compute the likelihood of its own input, well, if you have two of these and one was trained on one thing you care about and the other was on the other thing you care about, well, that's the easiest way to do any kind of Bayesian computation that that religion drives you to do. So what this seems to suggest is that the way we can do a really good job of understanding the structure of the code gives kind of a very clear way of what the neural circuit can do in trying to implement these things and how you, you can use that to do stuff with it. Um, how much time do I have? Minutes. Okay. So um, what we get from this is basically uh, because we're very shallow people, we get a shallow neural network, we're not deep at all, um, that relies on these random projections. Um, and what we got is a set of things that we didn't put in to begin with. And, and some of them has very interesting flavors, uh, some of them of the biological nature. So it's super accurate. Um, it actually needs surprisingly little amounts of data to learn the model. I didn't show you, but I can tell you about this later if you wanna uh, play with this. Um, it relies on sparse uh, projection activation. It's this notion of sparse connectivity is of course very common in the brain. It's very easily scalable if you wanted to, to try and look at larger and larger things. Uh, well, maybe not very easy, but it's easily scalable. Um, and it's a just kind of a framework for actually implementation of Bayesian computation in, in real networks. And there's a bunch of other things we play with in terms of what happens if you try pruning mechanisms, just like people see in synaptic pruning things. There's decorrelation properties that this thing achieves. And we even came up with learning rules of how this actually could happen in such a real network uh, for real life. Um, so that's kind of the, where we stand with, with the models that do an extremely good job of describing large populations and a possible idea of how real networks might actually compute these very models. And so I wanna uh, go into uh, um, the equivalent of Mordor uh, um, in, in the last few minutes and, and talk about uh, um, uh, trying to say something about the uh, networks that actually generate these kinds of codes. And so, of course, there's the Olympics of, uh, of trying to get detailed connectivity patterns among neurons and these uh, connectomes are all going to come and, and uh, change everything we can think or do with, with kind of uh, looking at you know, real networks, but, um, but we're not there yet, right? There's, there's not enough data to, to try and make these uh, connections very simply. But we still thought maybe it's time to start thinking about the architectures that could actually achieve certain things. And so, um, so I'm gonna try and describe the, the first uh, uh, thing we did in trying to make concrete connections. Um, and, and, and we started with, with simulating small networks, again, because the, the, we thought, I mean, first of all, there's not a lot of uh, uh, connectomic data to play with, but also, if we cannot solve this for simulated networks, then why bother with the real data, right? I mean, let's start with the place where we know everything, when we can generate as much data as you can possibly hope for and, and, and see where, where this takes us. So um, the game is the following. We're gonna take uh, uh, recurrent networks. So they're gonna be of different uh, religious, religion uh, uh, beliefs and stuff in a minute, but, but basically we're gonna give them inputs of some class. Uh, we got to measure, uh, sort of simulate, you know, a, a recurrent uh, network of spiking neurons, and we're going to get the, the output. In this particular case, there are only four neurons, and I'm going to look at the uh, activity patterns of, uh, um, of this network in response to a particular class of inputs, let's say that they all got 
some input rate coming in. And so I'm going to describe the response of this particular network by the distribution of, of words, binary words you get in response to a class of stimuli. We can play with different variants later, which we did, but this is kind of the, the simplest version of this. So now I wanna try and measure what I can think of as the functional similarity of these networks. And of course, we know back from, from uh, um, many of the just phenomenal works of Eve Marder, and in particular that with Astrid Prince about how you can get very different, uh, or you can have very diff similar behavior from networks that have very different parameters. What we aim at is saying, well, let's look at you know, different networks and compare their function and then go and ask about the structure. So if I have a set of networks and they all respond to the exact same stimuli that presented to all of them, um, we have the different responses that they give. Um, so if I want to compare you know, network G and G prime, I'm going to look at the distribution of responses with which it kind of uh, 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 how much it likes the particular stimuli. And the measure of the overlap of the distribution is in, you know, is the measure of how similar these networks because they got the exact same input. And this is a measure of how different are their outputs. And so uh, in this particular case, we took all the uh, architectures of uh, four neurons of the 4,096 of these. Um, and so we have this big blue matrix of uh, similarities between architectures. And now you can start playing with this and ask, well, what can we read out of this? So, um, so uh, here's a little bit more interesting version of this. We did this for many different ones, I'll tell you in a minute, but here's an example of networks of 15 neurons, which are, uh, have EI populations in them. Uh, we sampled 10,000 of these. And so there are 50 million pairs you can look at. And then we asked, well, how, if I measured the sim functional similarity in terms of neural response to the same input uh, of these networks, uh, how well can I predict it from some uh, structural features of these networks because you look at them and you may have a feeling this one looks kind of very different from this one or not. So here's now a plot with 50 million dots on it, as you can see. Um, and um, each of these dots is, is just one pair of networks. This is the similarity between the distribution of the responses. So this is the functional measure of how similar they are. And this is the Euclidean distance between these uh, binary well, if you think of the graph, this is going to be um, just the uh, things of the overlap of the two. And here, these were uh, um, synapses that came from a, a log normal distribution to make Yuri Bujaki happy. So this is just the Euclidean distance between the, these two matrices. And as you can see, uh, there's virtually no relations between this measure of, of structural similarity and the function of these networks. Oh, fine, I mean, this, you know, why would this be Euclidean thing? So we tried the other kind of things. We went to our favorite graph theory book and we picked actually 27 different measures that graph theory people like in terms of measuring things about graphs. Um, I'm showing you only six because the computer screen is not big enough. Um, anyhow, um, here are six of them. Um, and what I'm measuring, showing here is the overlap between the prediction of the, so this is the correlation value of a matrix like of the structure like this thing here, this is measuring how well the structural thing predicts the functional. Um, some do a little bit better than the others, but they're not that impressive. Now, again, not that surprising because the thing in the graph theory book is the thing that people who care about graphs care about. Um, the fact that we care about the fact that there's a dynamical system that lives on this graph is usually not something they really uh, appreciate. And so we thought, well, Maybe um, not all hope is lost. Maybe we could, instead of guessing what are the features or using the thing from the book, we should try and learn them. So this is what we did. Let's try and learn a measure of the similarity between the synaptic maps and see how well we can predict things. Uh, so in particular, I'm gonna take the difference between the individual synapses in terms of their weight, make you know, a vector out of this. And then there's an optimization problem to solve of finding the matrix so if this is the actual similarity of the response of the neurons, I'm gonna look for a matrix M that's gonna give the right weights to the synapses and minimize the distance between the two and some marginalized to make everything work in a sensible way. And when we did this, uh, this is what we got. I mean, we can predict the functional similarity. This is of course all you know, cross-validated on networks we didn't train on. Um, then we can do a really good job. And if we compare this in terms of how accurate the, this thing is, 
we now get to uh, you know a little over 0 0.8 in terms of the correlations with these things. So we did this for many different kinds of networks, different size, different shapes, different uh, synaptic profiles, different I mean, a lot of different versions. And the thing, key thing for us, we say, can we? Well, we we learned the model to predict this. Nice. Is there something that you know we can identify in terms of what the features the, the features of the similarity are? I mean, can hopefully maybe we can find something that would make sense. And so through a set of uh, um, uh, factorization of matrices and tricks that I'm not, not gonna have the time to tell you about, we found that there are basically three uh, uh, key features that seem to be the ones that are the ones that control this M thing that, uh, with which we can predict the similarity, which is that the total synaptic sum that comes into each neuron, the total synaptic output that goes out of each neuron, and in some cases you need also the uh, the, the nature of the pairwise loops, but that, that's kind of not, yeah, usually you don't even need that. Um, and then we said, well, let's see how well we do just with these. So now I'm gonna build a model that's going to try to predict the similarity of two networks in terms of how they respond to inputs just from this set of structural measures, just the total synaptic inputs per neuron, the total synaptic outputs per neuron, um, which is uh, on, on the order of two end parameters. And this is the agreement for, again, validated data from this input and output uh, sets for 15 neurons. Um, and this is uh, above even 0 0.85. So then we went and did this for uh, every kind of variance we can imagine. So we played with different kinds of uh, stimuli of different um, structures that you can uh, make sense of. We played with different kinds of rules of generating architectures of the networks because you know, maybe the, that's the uh, probably is going to depend on the nature of excitatory, how many excitatory do you have and you know, how sparse the connections are. Um, we played with uh, more naturalistic stimuli. So we took spikes from the Allen Institute recordings and fed them as input to their networks and not just to make things from our Poisson, whatever thing we play with. And we played with networks now from the side, you know, up going up to a thousand neurons. Um, here, there are kind of a lot of technical things about how you measure some of the similarities, which we can talk about later. Bottom line is, in all of these cases, this family of features was enough to do a remarkably good job of predicting the similarity of the response of the networks. So these are now curves for the three population sizes. You see they're all on top of each other, so it doesn't really matter that much. And this is as a function of the density of connection on the class of networks that, that we looked at. So theory is turning up, so I need to finish. Um, what I try to uh, show you is that um, we seem to identify you know, um, a set of uh, principles about the structure of the code, but this seems to shift as the size of the population changes. But um, this new uh, family of models that is based on random projections seems to be um, super um, accurate, very uh, efficient in terms of what you need to learn it with and scalable. Um, it has, again, this notion of, you know, this reflect on what could be a neural circuit that learns these things. And uh, at some level, maybe this so canonical architecture that it says something about the kind of computations that neural circuits do in general. And then we met, made our first foray into trying to link our structure and function in spiking networks. Again, these are the toy models we played with. We try to make them as rich and wonderful and smart as they can possibly be. But um, um, I hope that in the next uh, birthday party, I'll come and tell you about how, what we managed to do with real connectors. So uh, just to give credit to the people who did the work that I described today. So these are the people in the lab and collaborators and the people who gave us money, all the names in bold font, some of which you know, um, were kind of key players in all of this game. Um, so thank you for your time. And one last word, um, um, having worked on uh, networks of elements that do things together and interacting with one another, uh, one becomes very appreciative of the impact that the other nodes in the graph have on individual nodes in the graph. So it's especially wonderful to be here with so many old friends and some people that I'm connected to by uh, two steps away, but still I know of them and of, uh, and. Uh, in particular, to say thank you to the latent factor that is uh, the reason we're all here. Thank you, Bill. That's it.
Que nem. Great talk a lot. Um, I, I was just very curious uh, about the random projection. Um, model. So how many random projections, like how's the number of uh, random projections that you need scale with the number of neurons? Or do you have a, do you have like a quick scaling rule of thumb that yeah. you can relate? Um, so I don't have a uh, clear uh, uh, rule of thumb for the scaling. We went up to about um, almost 400 neurons um, and we can do reasonably well there um, with something that was on the order of, uh, you know, if the naive th answer would be something on the order of n log n, okay? Um, but then uh, we actually came up with the uh, notion that, you know, what we did here, again, this was intentional. We picked the projections like this, and then I, you know, did the best I could with them. Um, so maybe not all of them are so good for me. So we tried two different things. One was to say, what if I had this pruning? That was this thing that I mentioned about pruning. What if I threw away projections that seem to be not working very hard um, and replace them with new random projections and do this uh, thing, which is very similar to the movies that you can see of sign up, synapses dancing and changing all things. When we did this, this improved. So this, when you do this, you can actually become much more efficient with every projection because you throw out the ones that are not interested in the thing you care about. And so we get there something which gets close to about order N, which is this is up to a few hundred neurons that we played with. Um, there are other variants of this that we're playing with. We didn't go above that population sizes. Um, as far as much as these things are scalable, I'm sure that when we try to go beyond this will become painful again in some way. Um, there is a point where one needs to ask oneself at what fidelity you need to build a model for a population. I mean, we're here getting to um, detailed activity patterns over hundreds of neurons, um, even testing that you do well, it's a tricky game here, but um, so uh, I should qualify maybe a little bit of my excitement about how scalable it is. We haven't gone beyond 400. But there again, we, we need a few thousand, you know, up to 10,000 that we can do pretty well with. What about the size? Sorry, I didn't hear it. Don't. Ah, ah, very good. Um, so um, we played a lot with the size of the projections and it turns out that um, it's really good to have sparse projections, namely that each read up projection neuron or the thing that, you know, is not summing over too many neurons. It needs to do this over a small, relatively small set. Um, there's a beautiful work from uh, Ashok Ritri Kumar uh, and company in, in Colombia about this in the uh, cerebellum and the, and the olfactory system of, of flies. And um, they had similar results about how sparse connections might be a good thing here. It seems like being sparse is actually much better for this, this uh, kind of thing. If you have too many inputs, uh, and you try random projections with many um, inputs, do you start, things could start going bad on you. So this seems to be a hidden feature of this as well. But you must have some trade-off with the inputs, but a little bit of overlap, right? Yes. So, um, um, so we, um, I mean, most of, I mean, all of what I've shown today was about trying to see what happens if you do this. So this is some version of the birthday uh, problem, right? I mean, you wanna get some overlap and then you wanna get the right coverage. If you're willing to try and tweak things, again, you can do significantly better with fewer things. And then there must be some, I think that if, again, if this is something that real networks do, um, something need to control that sparsity. If it is just about learning models, we need to be smarter about this. So we need to figure out what are the, um, computational design features of this set of projections. And maybe you can think of scanning this up and so kind of putting one projection on top of the other and kind of uh, connecting to the thing that Linoy and Bill and David did with uh, trying to do renormalization on these things. <laughs>